Tuesday, June 24, 1996. Uh, uh, Galen was in uh, Laos, That's correct. northern provinces mm -hmm. for the most part, uh, between when and when? All over the country. All over the country. Okay, I went beginning to Laos in 1962, mm -hmm. somewhere around June the 7th or something, and uh, was there until approximately the same date in 1972. Mm -hmm. And I worked first in Vientiane, and then, well, I did take some time out and worked for about six months in northern Saiburi province, mm -hmm. a place called Xianglong, and then was back in Vientiane, and joined AID, and worked in Saravan, in Pakse, in Kinghok, in Savannakhet, and finally back in Vientiane, and uh, Samtong, and Bansong. Okay, and but your service in IBS was? That was IBS from 1962 to 1966. Okay, great. Okay, let me just move this a little bit. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait. That's fine. Uh, we ha I have, there are some standard questions I asked just to start off, for just for comparison purposes. Uh, your birth date was? November 1937. And uh, you were born? In? La Habra, California. La Habra, California. And did you go to high school in La Habra, California? No. Nah. Uh, we moved in La Habra, California, and we moved to, oh, let's see, Clovis, New Mexico, hmm. Parsons, Kansas, Chicago, Illinois, and we came back here in 1949. Why, why the movie? My father was a minister mm -hmm. and had to complete his degree in Chicago, and after we got back, my mother became a school teacher. She had the degree anyway, but she had three small boys. Mm -hmm. So I was basically the child of a pastor and a minister, uh, minister and a uh, school teacher. Mm -hmm. And you had two other, two other, did, yeah, that two, two size, brothers, stay, two size brothers. family stayed the same. Mm -hmm. Two younger brothers. Did, did they ever do any overseas service? One brother went to Taiwan with uh, Taiwan Christian Service. Mm -hmm. Ran a soup kitchen for two years. They had a completely different reaction because I was in Laos when they were in Taiwan. And I would ride my motor scooter all over the country and just to see what there was and anything that looked interesting, I'd stop and start asking questions and have a good time. And he and my sister in law wrote a letter to the effect that they were driving down a street or they were going down a street one day, possibly in a bus, and they looked over and they saw this whole street blocked off and there was all sorts of festivals and fireworks and things burning and, and it was really something. So I wrote back and said, well what happened? What was it? And they wrote back and said, we don't know, we never stopped. And and they, she absolutely hated the two years uh -huh. and I absolutely enjoyed the ten years just because I was wandering all over the place mm -hmm. and see something interesting and drop whatever you're doing and do that instead. Mm -hmm. That's great. So that was the only only overseas experience. Well, my other brother went to Mexico uh, a couple of times uh, on some science expeditions to collect marigolds and do some mm -hmm. study or other. But that was about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you did you what did you go to Laverne College? Yeah. And uh, what year did you graduate? Graduated from uh, Laverne College, now the University of Laverne, 1959. Mm -hmm. and, and then following that, I went to. Uh, Brethren Volunteer Service in Washington, D.C. area, New Windsor, Maryland. Um, I was a 1AO, which means I was a conscientious objector. And let's see, two guys and four gals, we all got into a car and drove from here to New England and then drove back to New Windsor, Maryland. And uh, there were four of us, two we dropped off en route. And the other four of us then were members of the same Brethren Volunteer Service Unit. And in November of 1959, they said, we've got an uh, assignment for you. It's in uh, Washington, D.C. You love to type, you know, all that work in the yearbook and newspaper and so on. And we've got an assignment for you in Washington, D.C. in the offices of International Voluntary Services. And I said, International Voluntary Service? And they said, International Voluntary Services, you know, because Brethren Volunteer Service, I had it wrong mm -hmm. at the beginning. And 
I was a little bit nonplussed at this because everybody else was going to Germany to rebuild devastated country or down to uh, Central America or to an Indian reservation where they would put on dungarees and dirty shirts and go out and do work with people and stuff. And here I was ending up in a office in Washington, D.C. wearing a white shirt sitting at a typewriter and a necktie. And uh, I went to New Windsor and stayed at a, a shelter, I don't know what you call it, one of these neighborhood homes, which is supposed to be the focal point for revitalizing a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I stayed there for about a week, sleeping on a couch in the living room, and because I had to find a place to live, and ended up um, boarding with an old retired semi-retired Navy person who had a whole house full of antiques and a shelf full of National Geographic's going back to 1894. So every morning I'd read one of these National Geographic's and then walk, well, about three quarters of a mile to the offices of International Voluntary Services. At that time, IBS was a very small organization. There were three of us in the office. The man I went there to replace, uh, joined a team that went to Liberia. There were two guys who went. His name was Frank Brainerd. The other guy's name was Joe Loomis. And Joe Loomis was a agricultural engineer, and I forget, Brainerd had worked on some aspect of agriculture, and, but he had been the recruiting secretary, or recruiting assistant for IBS for about six months, and basically you typed letters. It was a big day a year or so later when we finally got our first mimeograph machine. It was a Gestetner, top of the line, and we had a little session from the man that sold it to us and learned how to run the thing so we could start mimeographing things instead of sending them out to be mimeographed and bringing them back. Mm -hmm. So I would walk the mile to work uh, in the offices of IBS. It was a sort of a V-shaped apartment, two-bedroom apartment. Wait a minute, take that back. It was a one-bedroom apartment in the Woodner Hotel, which uh, overlooked to the south a vast, empty area where people walked their dogs. And it became the site of the hotel where President uh, Reagan was shot at. Can't think of the name. That's, that was built on this empty lot uh, after I left. On uh, Connecticut? No, this is a... Connecticut Avenue right. in, in Washington, D.C. No, that's what I meant. Okay, yeah. the street runs around that's like the, this. That's the, and then, that's the, that's the, the Washington, D.C. Hilton. Okay, that's yes. where the Hilton was uh -huh. built. Okay. I think, oh, wait, I know what that built. I know what that Okay, you drive, go, you're, you're going up Connecticut Avenue right. and it turns around Columbia Road. Right. And this is an right. apartment house facing uh -huh. the street. Uh -huh. It's a rather pleasant area, lots of trees, mm -hmm. a statue of uh, General McClellan down at the corner facing south. And, uh, it was an interesting office because there were a total of three of us in it. My boss, who was a, who was Dr. Nuffsinger, a rather portly older gentleman in his 60s or 70s. Doesn't seem as old now, but he was a terribly old man then. He had a rather florid confec uh, complexion, a rather large head, and glasses and coughed a lot and wore the same Parker blue suit for the uh, entire time I knew him. Um, I believe he'd had red or brown hair once, there was not much of it left. And he was the guiding force uh, at the head of IBS as the executive director. I'd been there about maybe four months and he called me into his office one day and he said, uh, you know, this is a very important day for me. I racked my brain trying to think of what was going on. And it turned out that it was 40 years to that day that he had been the head of the group of teachers who had gone from the United States to rebuild uh, the Philippines and set up the Filipino educational system as it exists today. And he was in the forefront of getting things organized and setting up teacher seminars and so on and was still remembered in the field. And I keep running on his name as, as uh, 
being in a lot of different organizations, you know, occasionally in Church of the Brethren literature because mm -hmm. he was a uh, man of some stature. The other person we had was a an older secretary to whom he'd given a job out of compassion. And uh, she was such a bad secretary that after she went home, I retyped some of her letters and mailed them because they had errors everywhere. And she uh, was quite a character, very afraid of men and very old. And he said one day that he had followed her the day he paid her and discovered that she went to a big restaurant and got the biggest T-bone steak that they had. And she always apparently ran out of money before the next paycheck. Dr. Knopfsinger became sick shortly after I began to work at the office. I was getting used to the different uh, organizations and people and going to the Church of the Brethren in Washington, D.C. And uh, he became sick, and so for about, I think it was four to five weeks, I ran IBS, mm -hmm. which shows how long time ago it was. Um, I would dictate letters occasionally to her, although it was kind of an odd situation, but she'd just sort of sit at her desk and quiver because there was nothing to do. My main job was to go down to the post office or wherever we got the mail, bring it back, open it, check the letters and see what there was. And the important things I'd take to Dr. Knopfsinger at his home in his apartment where he was recovering. and We'd look him over and he'd tell me what to do and how to handle it. And I ended up writing letters. I wrote letters to people who were interested in working for IBS and I sent out letters to references asking for evaluations of the people and well, I received those and put them together and then I would assemble teams to go to various countries. I'd kind of analyze what we needed at various countries. The IBS at that time was still growing. It was very, very small. I think we had a total of 36 people or something like that. Had board meetings about four times a year in which I learned how to take notes and was the secretary for the groups. And we would assemble teams and uh, keep abreast of what was happening. A team is going to Cambodia. And you'd kind of be appraised of what to look for and you'd take all of the applications that came in from people who worked at agricultural colleges and try and analyze what they needed and try and assemble an agricultural engineer and a livestock man and, and so on. I, you know, set myself to do what was necessary. Uh, although I do remember one time Dr. Knopfsinger was a little unhappy because I had assembled a team for Cambodia which consisted of seven candidates, all whose name began with B. Uh, Barlow, Beasley, and he, he thought that was taking it a bit far. Uh, but it was not a hard job. There was a lot of stuff to do and to keep you busy. In 1961, or 1960, it began to be a little more interesting because we had a team which went from the U.S. Congress to see what was happening in Vietnam. And they went to Vietnam and Laos and they came back just raving about the IBS teams. The members of the team were Congressman or Senator Humphrey, Hubert Humphrey, and Congressman Royce and Newberger. Uh, I think Royce was from Oregon. I'd, I'd have to, you know, do a little research. But they came back with this absolutely glowing report on the IBS teams in Laos and Vietnam and uh, wrote it into the congressional record. And we got a copy of this thing and we ended up having this duplicated, you know, photo offset, really expensive then. And thousands of copies made, and every time a letter went out, we dropped this thing in and sent it out. And they were heartily recommending the United States have more of these point four youth court teams. Humphrey then in, began in the election running against John F. Kennedy, a Democratic ticket, and he found out that he was getting more uh, stuff coming out of his point four youth court idea, more reaction from the public than anything else. And so he... Uh, when it appeared the figures were favoring 
Kennedy rather than him. He went in with Kennedy and he told him that his, uh, he was getting all this public reaction. Kennedy took over it, went to the University of Michigan and standing on the steps of the university came out with his proposal for the Peace Corps, which unfortunately did not spring forward like full-blown like Minerva from the brain of Zeus, but it was actually from Humphrey, who in turn got it from this trip they'd made to Southeast Asia. Where did the term Four Point uh, Youth Program come from? Well, the, the uh, IVS itself was came out of the Point Four Program. It was the Four Points, I believe, made by Marshall after World War II. Uh, you know, I get them mixed up with the Four Freedoms at this point in time, but the Point Four Program did get uh, Europe revitalized to the point under the Marshall Plan that um, there was a comment made at one time that there was the government wished that it could get the same type of dedicated missionary personnel that went overseas as the churches did. And what happened around 1954, a group of representatives from many of the churches got together and they talked about this at length and they sent a delegation in to see I don't know that it was Marshall for, but it was uh, Dulles. Went in to see Dulles and asked John Foster Dulles how he would like to see this happen as they represented all the churches. And Dulles indicated that he would, if the they could form a independent interdenominational group which could search out and find these type of young Americans to go overseas and work, that he would see if the U.S. government could contract to have such teams uh, when they were assembled and send them overseas to work at uh, self-help grassroots programs in the developing countries. Uh, now there was one provisio which was there was to be no propagandizing and proselytizing. And the group went back, thought about this for a while, and formed International Voluntary Services. It was kind of interesting at that time because you could still go through the files. We had two filing cabinets, four drawer. That shows how long ago. <laughs> uh, and I remember finding one little folder, which was the draft proposals of the emblem for IVS. And one showed two hands reaching from both sides holding a, uh, um, some sort of a Maddox superimposed on the world. And there was notes written on it. it looks too much like they're fighting. Uh, it was very well done. It was, you know, a piece of paper with a, a kind of a drafting paper over it and the drawing and everything. And then they had a second one showing a uh, torch superimposed on the earth. And the one they finally settled on was a circular one with the with the uh, torch uh, over the entire thing. They, they in, ended up using it letterheads for years and a pin. said International Voluntary Services around the outside. And uh, so the organization started going. It had a team which went to Iraq, uh, operated under the Iraqi Ministry of Education or the Ministry of Agriculture, I don't remember which. And one of the first things I did when I was there, they had a box that was all oh, about two feet by a foot and a half by about two feet high. And this was all of the papers from the Iraq team, which had been sent back in 1956. Um, well, I think they started at 54 and it went to 56, or it could have been 55 to 57. but. At the end of the two years, the Iraqi team had folded and everybody had come home and they'd sent all the paperwork back. And it had been sitting in the office. So with Dr. Knopfsinger's approval, and there not being a lot of things to do, I went through this very slowly and gently and put everything into order and sat down and wrote about a six-page synopsis, single-spaced, of everything that had happened in Iraq from the day they went over to what they went through and how they went through it, where the teams were... Uh, place, some of the comments. Uh, in other words, it was a synopsis of all, and if it was, as if I may say, done rather well, actually. 
uh, analytic history. It was one of the things I think that was thrown away in 1967 when they decided to clear all the files. So I don't even know if there's any trace of the Iraqi team remains. So we had the team in Iraq. Uh, there was a team in northern India and only it was known as the IBS team in Nepal, and it was roughly the same time period, 56 to 58. And this was not a large team, five or six people, and they, they specialized in training uh, village development workers in uh, some of what became the basics of IBS work in Southeast Asia, which was wells, roads, dams, uh, small technology projects, livestock, agriculture, health and sanitation. And they were training village development workers to go out in the villages. This team, team ended after two years because of another strange situation. They had a border change and this part of Nepal where they were working became northern India. And India already had their own cadres plus the ones that had been trained, and they decided, well, we've got our own people to do this, and we don't need these IBSers, so IBS came home. So you had two, two uh, teams that ended, which were in Iraq and Nepal, and then the uh, uh, Southeast Asia experience began to increase, and IBS ended up with teams in Vietnam, and in Laos, and in Cambodia. And I watched all of these go and recruited people to go there and still run across their names every now and then. You know, just ordinary. Uh, Brock Muller is in Vietnam. And uh, the team in Laos is having slight problems doing with uh, um, revolutions and things like this. While we were recruiting for the team in Laos, it was probably uh, February or March. No, it was probably... April and May about 1961, there was this farmer from uh, Indiana came in one day. I knew he was coming, and Dr. Knopfsinger had been in correspondence and reading all the information on him with a great deal of interest. I opened the door one day, and here was this short little dark man with big horn rimmed glasses and introduced himself as me and Ed Graham Buell. And uh, he came in, and we talked for two or three minutes, and Dr. Knopfsinger sat in his office with the door closed, always making it look as if he were doing some important paperwork, and finally came out, and they greeted him effusively, and they disappeared in the, in the office, and they talked for maybe an hour and a half. And he came out, and he talked for me four or five minutes, and then he took the tickets and the itinerary and everything I had for him and uh, walked out into the hall and closed the door and came back. Dr. Knopfsinger was standing there and he said, well, what did you think of Mr. Buell? And I said, well, he's a, he's a bit older than the you know, young graduates that we've been recruiting. And he said, well, he's 48, he looks a little older, but uh, I have a feeling we're going to hear quite a bit from this man. And so Buell flew, flew to uh, Laos I would prepared an itinerary where he met people going to Laos and met them en route. And uh, so that was, that was the beginning of one of the changes in the IBS team in Laos, which they, they'd started out in, in northern Laos and they'd moved down to, uh, to Vientiane given all everything that was going on there. But Pop, later years, used to tell me all these little stories about what it was like about being on the Plain of Jars and where he was in Lat Huang. And here was this dusty little city with huge trees and the sound of temple bells and little, little spires from the tops and pagodas here and there. And how it was just the most beautiful, nice, bucolic scene you could imagine. So we had teams in Vietnam and we had teams in Laos teams in Vietnam always seemed to be having problems. I was not really enthused about it. But the more I went down to the Lao Embassy to get visas, I, I, I would get handfuls of passports and I would go around to the embassies literally and have everything stamped and taken care of. And I uh, began to be intrigued with the Lao Embassy because they were always so laid back and they were just such nice people. 
The secretary's name was named Jacqueline Rodriguez. Her father was French, her mother was Lao, and she was married to a Argentinian and working in the Lao Embassy in Washington, D.C., and she was just delightful. And uh, I began to appreciate the, the Lao beauty and the, and the culture and, and just rather enjoyed that. And so my interest began to be focused more on Laos than it was in Vietnam, where it always seemed to be just a bit cold reception at the Vietnamese embassy. I also went down to the Cambodian embassy and started getting visas for a team that we were sending to Cambodia. But to go back a bit, the... Uh, this point for youth care thing was taking uh, root. Um, when Humphrey got interested in this, and after this we started sending his paperwork out, uh, this bit of congressional record, the office he was in began to send over a young man, I don't know his name now, but he wore a sort of a lightweight blue and white pinstripe suit that was popular in those days, poplin or something like this. Blue and white pinstripe and sort of a reddish tie. And he would sit there and he would talk with me a number of minutes before Dr. Doc Singer would deign to open the door and invite him into his office. And they would sit and talk for an hour and a half. And this guy would take notes and he would go back and he would say bye. And he would head out. And... Uh, about a day and a half later, it would be in all the newspapers. Is this great new idea they had for the Point Four Youth Corps, and here's how it would be set up, and here is how it would work, and it was pretty much based on what Dr. Knopfsinger and this uh, chap had, what he gained from Dr. Knopfsinger's comments and ideas and wisdom, and this again was leading to the genesis of the Peace Corps. Uh, it would be a spate of about six weeks this would be happening and things would be quiet for a couple of weeks and then he'd be coming in again and getting more stories and, and you could open the uh, Washington Star and there would be all the information. So it was it was quite interesting being there at the Peace Corps, or at IVS when the Peace Corps was being formulated. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm going to have to have a quick yeah. trip here. One more. My mother died about a month ago uh -huh. and she used to take apart every damn thing in sight and I have a I have a total of four drawers full of nothing but tapes we don't know what to do with them mm -hmm. and uh, she subscribed to all of these things like focus on the family and stuff like that and they'd send her those three tapes and she'd mm -hmm. never listen to them I, I swear there's four drawers full of them in there well, if you're talking about donating tapes, tapes yeah. oh, absolutely, oh, okay. sure, because uh, uh, we want to, uh, you know, you always want to do safety backups, mm. you know, you'll always be making copies, okay. so it's, yeah, that'd be terrific, sure. Yeah. Anyway, so present at the creation. Oh, yeah, 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 it was kind of interesting, and and what is one particular frustrating thing about it all is that Xerox machines were not highly developed, as I remember they were brown over time and they looked really bad. And I never made copies of this, but I wrote the history of the Nepal team. I wrote the history of the uh, Vietnam team, you know, as far back as I could get it. I might have some of this, but not much. Another thing that is disappointing in that it has not survived except outside of Washington is that we had a, a newsletter service for the people that joined IVS. And you went overseas and you could write back a letter a month and we would Xerox, the, or excuse me, we'd mimeograph the full thing and send it out to all your friends and relatives. Now, uh, I, after a while I went and talked to Dr. Knopfsinger, we did set up some rules. It was no more than four pages, no more than 50 people because the postage, yeah, it was three cents, but it was great publicity. Mm -hmm. And we'd get these, it would take, be two sheets of paper, and they would be uh, mimeographed on both sides, and we had an IBS letterhead, and print their letter, and at the bottom put the permission to quote from this letter in whole, or, or in part, uh, must be secured by writing to International Voluntary Services, etc. Mm. And uh, they were just valuable, and people, I mean, it was so easy. Everybody wrote you, and then you wrote one letter, and IBS would take care of the details. And in the meantime, it cost us a little money, but it 
enabled us to keep track of what was happening. Mm -hmm. I still have all of mine. I have some of other people's, but not a lot. Uh, but we always would keep the original plus the copies in the person's file. And sometimes you could look back and, and see something be developing. But this would give you details from, oh, how to bury a clay pot in a rice paddy so that the uh, crabs would fall into it and be trapped and you could dispose of them, uh, or what it was like to be showing films from U.S. Information Service in a village at night, uh, relationships with the government nationals, uh, problems of warfare, uh, how long a snake could live after sundown. I mean, they'd throw every darn thing in the world in these letters, and they were really, really great. You had to explain some of them to people, because when we had new recruits that were being sought after to go with IBS, and we had a, a form extending them an offer letter, we had about a dozen form letters, most of which I took the old ones and began to work out in a compatible format, so it was A to B to C and so on. Um, when we sent these to them, we'd make some notice here, a couple of news letters from uh, IBSers who were over there and just uh, throw them in, and people would get interested just reading the newsletters from people. I too, uh, and uh, I can commence. Go ahead. We're talking to uh, Galen Beery. So you were talking about oh yeah, we we sent copies of these letters out, and uh, uh, among my duties was to get the teams together. I.e., I would work out a. I'd call up the airlines and I would make a manifest where somebody started in Maine and they would fly to New York, and. Uh, in New York, he would meet another guy at the airport, and I had a, seats with them together on the next plane, and, and this would fly on to Washington. And in Washington, they would go to a certain hotel, and they would meet five other people, and they would be named such and such. And I would write pretty much the same letter to each one with different paragraphs saying where we started and where it connected. Mm -hmm. So they could sit there and read exactly where they go, and they got to the hotel, They'd all troop in, get a Dr. Knopfsinger would meet them, or we might prepare some meeting at the Agricultural Service or so on. Give them two or three days in Washington, and they would go down to the airport and climb on a plane. They would fly to uh, Kansas City, and they would pick up another man who'd been to see us a month before, fly to Los Angeles, uh, pick up two men who we talked to five months before and were finally joining the group, and then they would all proceed to Vietnam uh, together on the same flight, seven or nine people. And it was during one of these briefings that one of them pulled me over and grilled me at length as to whether this was a Christian outfit. And it finally turned out that he had received a uh, letter that one of the team members had written uh, from Laos or Vietnam, where after he, he, in his last paragraph, he told something about seeing the country and the people. And so that night before he got into his cot, he would kneel and praise the Lord. Uh, give a prayer of thanks for being in the United States and, and he was in a position to, to help these people to a better way of life. And this guy had read this and got kind of worried that he was joining a, a rather religious outfit. And I'd point uh, out that many of our people were uh, former missionaries or children of missionaries or church members and had this sort of uh, zeal, but it was expressively expressly forbidden to prop propagandize or proselytize. Mm -hmm. And he, he went away more relaxed about the whole thing. So somewhere around 1961, in the early part of 1961, Dr. Nofsinger got to the point where he was going to have to re be replaced. And he brought in a younger man by the name of Stevenson, who was a very, very charismatic, very nice guy. And he, in turn, brought in an aid man by the name of Glenn R. Riddell, uh, a rather chubby older man who always cupped a pipe and spoke 
lovingly of growing rice in India and things like that. Uh, he had big glasses and white hair and a Mercedes and, and he did a lot of desk type activities actually, <laughs> but he was a nice person. And we made a trip, moved the entire office up to the uh, a hotel at 3636 uh, 16th Street. Now the 1930 Columbia Road site, we were actually there incognito. It was a apartment house, not an office building. Mm -hmm. And I believe we were the only office in the place, although Dr. Knopfsinger felt that there was another one down the hall. And I think I ran into somebody I recognized doing some, uh, getting some mimeographing done once. Mm -hmm. So we moved up to 16th Street, which was a huge hotel, and this one had marble entrance built right at the edge of Rock Creek Park. And they were given permits actually to build two apartment house hotels. And so they built two separate ones. They were only about a quarter inch apart and they looked identical. <laughs> so it was, uh, there was some money passed in there and Dr. Knopfsinger told me about it. And when I told my uh, landlord where we were going, he said, you're moving up there? Oh, good heavens, that whole place is full of prostitutes. And there were some rather attractive ladies that were on the elevator at the time. So it was a, another environment where we were in a hotel. This was also, a, I mean, a apartment house. This mm -hmm. was uh, not an office building. And the office began to increase with uh, Dr. Stevenson and Glenn Riddell. There was a girl who had been in my BBS unit by the name of Carol Mills, and she'd been working at this uh, project house, the Adams Morgan mm -hmm. project. And uh, at the end of her year of working there as secretary and, and uh, doing various things involving raising school children uh, in kind of what daycare, um, she was not quite sure what to do. And I talked to my boss and, and uh, she was brought in and began working for International Voluntary Services as a secretary. Just did a great job. And uh, so she began to work there. And my time uh, had already expired with IBS. I was to do my alternative service for two years. And uh, talked to Dr. Knopfsinger and made a trip to California and came back and began to work just as an employee of IBS uh, in the Washington office and for another year. But I was aware that I was kind of interested in going overseas. Uh, in the first few months, 1962, we hired a guy who had been in my BBS unit uh, by the name of Val Peterson. Mm -hmm. And he was the first non-specialist that we had. We had these small teams that went overseas and they were, uh, everyone had degrees in their field. You would have a uh, home economist, mm -hmm. uh, livestock man who had a degree in livestock from Texas A&M. You would have a poultry specialist. You would have a veterinarian. You would have uh, somebody who'd specialized in farm machinery, a public health nurse. Mm -hmm. But they all had degrees or specialties in, in, in these fields and we hired Val, who was basically the first non-professional, uh, hmm. and he was the administrative assistant to the chief of party in Laos. And the chief of party was a guy by the name of Bob uh, Ziegler, who was an uh, old brethren uh, name. One of the things that I was very conscious was that these were drawn from different church groups who were almost in competition with each other to see who could have the most people uh, working under IBS and the Methodists wanted to make sure the Presbyterians didn't run it and vice versa. <laughs> anyway, Val was one of the uh, people who'd been in BBS and he went over to Laos back early in 1962 with a guy called Joe Flipsy who, among some of the other interesting things in his uh, application. Uh, apparently he'd been running white lightning down in Florida and uh, we'd get to drinking years later and he'd tell about how you always made sure you had something where you could dump the stuff out the back window if the sheriff was coming. Mm -hmm. When you were driving down the road you'd throw it out the back window of the car. One of the, one of the jobs we had also was to fill out these 
forms for the government because you needed you needed five copies of the regular U.S. government application. You had the IVS application, and you needed five copies of the uh, U.S. government employee form, and you had six copies of the FS-86, I think, F-86, something of this sort, uh, which was the uh, information provided for uh, security investigation. Mm -hmm. And remember, we still were working with carbon paper. That occupied an awful lot of times. And this is what Carol and the other secretaries, as they began to be hired, began to, to type up a lot of these things. Anyway, Val ended up over in Laos as an administrative assistant, looked it over, and, and was much more interested in working with something else. So I threw my hat in the ring as administrative assistant in Vientiane. And uh, the group there kind of looked it over and decided, well, yeah, I had as much as Val or, or more. And uh, he was out in the village already working. He wasn't interested in the headquarters thing. So I traveled to Laos in uh, it was June or July of 1962. I think it was June the 7th or something. Mm -hmm. And I had arranged this, so I met. I flew to California two weeks ahead of time met people coming from two or three other places, and then we went as a group to, I guess I met them in Hawaii, mm -hmm. and then we moved, uh, went to Hong Kong and did two or three days shopping and then went on to Vientiane. You know, I had this whole thing worked out, travel itineraries mm -hmm. and everything. And so I started working with IBS in Laos from 19, in 1962. The uh, first uh, week I was there, uh, I found out the IBS house was on the aid compound. There had been about 10 houses built for some incredible uh, sum of $490,000, which was 10 of these, 49000 each, which was not bad considering the villagers building it for about 2000 But there had been a lot of rip-offs and, and stuff under some earlier administrations of uh, AID, which was known as the ICA, Inter National Cooperation Administration. Mm -hmm. And ICA changed its name to AID at about the time, about 60, 61 or 62 in that period. Um, but there had been some scandals rocking Laos under Ambassador Parsons, I believe, of uh, huge payoffs being made and getting very little in back in the way of uh, infrastructure. So we ended up with a rather large building, which was three feet off the ground, little stairway went up to it, screened in porch, and it was built the old way where you had uh, four by four or six by six poles filled in with, with uh, woven uh, bamboo and wattle and plastered on either side, which was uh, kind of a combination between the Lao and the French way of, of putting it together. Um, our, the arrival of our little group of seven or eight uh, eight, double the size of the IBS team to 16. Mm -hmm. And uh, after I got a good night's sleep, uh, Bob showed me the office, which was there. and Bob Ziegler. Uh, Bob Ziegler. Right. Excuse me, that was the second move we made. It was within about six or seven weeks. We were in a sort of U.S. Army barracks building uh, at the uh, initially. It had maybe almost six or seven rooms in it, but it was a partitioned off a barracks building, it sat off the ground on the USAID compound. And um, he gave me a stack of keys and said, here, you're in charge. And I said, what? And he said, well, we've got this, uh, yesterday I got five apartments over there and I think we can get four people in and that'll take care of 20 people and go over and see this guy and there's a warehouse there and some this man, I think you can borrow his Jeep and we need to get beds and furniture and equipment over there. So I am starting out by moving beds and furniture, which I have since been led to believe in my mind is, is life itself is basically moving furniture around in many, many uh, aspects. 
So I ended up running. <laughs> it's true for me. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. In fact, I, I came in a t-shirt hoping that, you know, I could help you move some boxes. Uh, we can it later if you want. <laughs> My brother's coming over in about two hours. Anyway, we, we, I started moving in furniture and we had what was known as uh, 15 apartments and we had five of the apartments. And they were very simple little four bedrooms, uh, living room, uh, bath and kitchen, and a washing machine out back. And uh, so I put two beds in each one of the, you know, I put four beds to begin with and then eight and, and uh, I, you know, I got fairly efficient. Uh, I was the innkeeper for the IBF scheme. They came into town, they needed a place to sleep and a room to throw their stuff in and a lock on the door and I became an innkeeper. Then I ended up, started with the office staff. And Bob was going out in the streets and hiring nice young Lao men and women and bringing them in because we were going to need interpreters. He, he needed people that spoke fairly good English. And since they had nothing to do, we uh, started teaching them all typing. And I have some of the pictures of the early days that I took at the IBS office where there's a gal called Pet Song, who was Chinese Thai but professed to be pure Lao, and she's supervising a team of about five guys and they're all sitting at these pre-war uh, Smith Coronas all banging out from the books that we were able to dredge up and they were learning how to uh, to type. And we had then, we had Jeeps and somewhere we ended up with about 14 U.S. Army World War II Jeeps which had been worn out by the U.S. Army and given to the French who repaired them and wore them out and gave them to the Lao Army who repaired them and wore them out and gave them to us. And so I ended up in the Jeep parts procurement business. We hired a Lao mechanic and we had Joe Flipsy who was teaching the two Lao mechanics and always suspicious because he thought somebody was ripping off the parts, which was probably true. And he rented a barn somewhere and he was rebuilding Jeeps and we'd get these things going and paint the number. AVT402 was the one I had. Administrative Yen Chan and number 402 painted on the bumpers and it was it was a great vehicle and be worth five thousand dollars nowadays and they were rather creative and not too good jeeps i can remember a abt 402 you could shift gears without using the clutch if you listen to the sound just right and you're in the second gear or third gear or whatever so we got our office team involved where I'd walk in and say everybody ready for a party and they'd say what do you have Mr. Berry and I'd say this is a get the jeep out of the ditch party <laughs> and we'd go out and I learned the Chinese cooling method of okay everybody grab a corner one two three ooh! and you'd have it out and be driving off when somebody who went to get a jack came back and discovered everything was fixed. Uh, we also had a Land Rover that was left over from an early procurement and we had some great big Chevrolet van that we could carry eight or nine people in. So my job for the first year or so was to keep all this thing going and keep above board uh, and deal with little problems. I remember uh, Bob said, oh by the way you'll be wanting to take care of the uh, finances until the finance man gets here and uh, mentioned his name and I knew the guy I'd been a little skeptical about hiring him but uh, let's call him Anderson his name wasn't Anderson but mm -hmm. until Anderson gets here you'll be in charge of taking care of his uh, stuff so he pulled open a drawer and here were wads of keep notes which is rather beautiful money and it was all stapled together with a receipt and I said what's this and he said this is our finances this is the accounting system <coughs> and here were all these little bits of paper with notes on them and here were stacks of money in various wild colors and denominations and I'm supposed to fit there literally was that was the accounting system and I, I never did figure the thing out I finally put it into order and I knew how much went in and how much went out and what we bought and I could start providing receipts and keeping things straight that way. But I could never go back any further than the day I arrived and he pulled open the drawer. It was just a, it was a huge mess and we kept waiting for Anderson to arrive. <laughs> that was the accounting system and, and we had the housing system and then I was beginning to take 
open drawers and find photographs and reports and I began to start sorting everything and I'd have a uh, hiatus of something to do and I had two or three guys that were bored with typing so I'd say I'm going to teach you how to file and with Pet Song there, the Lao girl, and these three guys, I would sit down and, and explain the concept of filing system. You have numerical, you have chronological, you have categorical, and normally we use a numerical and or alphabetical. Okay, now I want you to sort out all these papers, and I'd have guys sitting there sorting out things, and, and Pet Song sorting out things, and making new, new file folders, and trying to get some sort of semblance out of chaos. Then we we're in the AID compound and and that was interesting in itself because you had all of these people that worked for the government had no idea what you were doing there except that you were there and there were some people that were they didn't exist they were the spooks and uh, they had a green building barracks just on the other side this little road there into the aid compound and uh, they were known as the spooks in the greenhouse which didn't make sense because the greenhouse you can see in and out you know but uh, well and uh, one day but their presence was transparent so maybe yeah uh, uh, let's it's reaching so down yeah. so you go down about one or two of the barracks and you come to the mess hall known as the ACA the American Community Association and it was basically a mess hall and uh, had you know, pretty good meals at reasonable prices, and that's where you normally ate unless you walked out the entrance to the compound. And uh, there was a, a little Chinese, Vietnamese, Lao restaurant out there that was built over a uh, mild swamp. Uh, and it was board floor, and, and, you know, you could empty your glass through the floor with no problem at all because the cracks were an inch wide black water underneath and you could eat breakfast there and you'd meet all sorts of interesting people. So we bit by bit got to know AID and you begin to know who ran what building. You, the, the guy that ran the print shop was always smoking a pipe and always mad at the world and wore a neck brace but there was ways to get on his good side and, and there was another man who wrote the motor pool or ran, ran the motor pool and and uh, had the vehicles, and uh, somebody else had the, the warehouse. And, and the thing to do was to wa wander through the warehouses and find out what was there uh, and keep it in your mind because a couple of years down the line, they keep changing people, and you go back a couple of years later and say exactly what they had and where it was, and you go and look, and behold it, the guy that ran the warehouse didn't know it was in that corner. So it was a it was a very interesting soup of activities uh, as we put IBS together. We moved IBS shortly after, oh, our man Anderson finally arrived and he was accompanied by a bright-eyed young guy by the name of Arnie Raddy who had an agricultural degree and an older man who was also you spell Raddy? R-A-D-I. Uh, Arnie? Arnold, I guess, mm -hmm. and uh, Arnie Raddy and this other guy, Bill Hollingsworth, I think, came at the same time, came with this guy. Pretty sure it was Hollingsworth. Anyway, they arrived with this guy, and uh, they really were dissimilar people, but the two of them crowded me in a small room, and they said, uh, we're a little concerned about this guy, and we, I said, why? He acted really odd on the way over. Well, like what? Well, he uh, he kept chatting up the the stewardesses on the plane, and he made a date with one of them, and uh, was real happy about it. And then he didn't go, and he kept laughing. He said, "I made a date," and she's probably sitting there in that hotel lobby waiting for me. And we just didn't think it was very good of him. And uh, and then Arnie says, "Yeah," and he bought some golf balls. And I said, was this strange? You know, my father plays golf. And went, no, he said, these are British golf balls, and they're an eighth of an inch smaller than American golf balls, and you can substitute them and hit your ball a lot further than the American ones. Mm. Well, they were concerned about the guy. There was something wrong. 
And uh, so they brought the, uh, they, they were out doing things. And Bob walked in one day and he said, we've got a problem. And I said, what's the problem? And he said, where's Anderson? And I said, well, he's around here somewhere. Weren't you talking to him? Well, yeah, I've talked to him. Galen, we've got a real problem. And I said, oh, well, last night something happened. Well, what was that? Well, I said, I got up and I walked out to get a drink or the bathroom or something. And he was sitting in the main room of our apartment talking with a Samla driver. Samla is a little three-wheeled uh, pedaling taxi that they had, bicycle type. And the uh, name Samla means literally three-wheel. And the interesting part was he didn't speak Lao and this guy didn't speak English and they were having these great conversations and I was thinking, wow, the guy had been in the country two days and he's already you know, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. What's going on here? Oh, I said, don't worry about it, Galen. I'll take care of it. And he kept staring at all those whiskey bottles. Well, next this morning I got up and all the whiskey was gone. And he said, don't worry, he'd gotten rid of it. And I kind of irritated because that those bottles were left over from the, the pilot that used to be there who, who died in the airplane uh, crash about three months ago, uh, just before we... You know, arrived here. Mm -hmm. So uh, I haven't seen him since. Well, Bob started walking around and I started walking around. I walked down the center of the building and I just opened all the doors and I'd look in and I opened the little door to this one back room and uh, looked in and there was our man, uh, Anderson, and he was standing there washing his shoe in the sink. You know, you know, scrubbing it off with this, you know, this liquid soap, which is not really good for an Oxford. And he was wearing, I believe he had a ring, and he had a belt, and he had a butter knife stuck in his belt. That was all he was wearing. And I realized at that particular moment this problem was real big. Uh, the guy was, you know, crazy. So, uh, Bob got some people and they got some sort of straight jacket or gave him something and got him dressed and and made it, got him to dress and and uh, I guess they gave him an injection which he seemed to be waiting for and they put him in a car and they drove him out to the American dispensary or no wait a minute we didn't have an American dispensary again that's how long ago it was it was the it was the Lau Hospital. And uh, he was basically uh, uh, Operation Brotherhood Hospital. Operation Brotherhood run by the, uh, uh, the Filipinos as part of their aid program to Laos. Okay. And uh, he was there for approximately a week. And he was, he was nuts. I mean, there was <laughs> no doubt about it. But he, he'd been recruited by IBS? He'd been recruited by IBS. And three months before, I'd taken the papers into Glenn Riddell and I'd showed them to him and I said, you know, this, this guy has a problem. Now, if somebody has five ministers, like Dr. Knoxinger said, somebody has one or two ministers who'll give a good reference, fine. But if somebody has five ministers and only ministers who give glowing references, what's the matter? Doesn't this guy know anybody but ministers? You know. Well, this guy lists psychiatrists and uh, <laughs> other people, and everyone will say, he uh, has had problems, and he has had treatment, and has recovered, and is performing satisfactorily. But they won't say what the problem was. And then he was working in this office full of, of women. There were no men there. And I mean, there's a lot of little red flags to set up. And Glenn leaned back in his chair, and he'd poke on his pipe, and he'd say, well, he, he may have had some problems, but he's gotten over them. Just read it, and uh, we think he's okay, and he's going to be the finance man. And a side on Glenn, by the way. I was typing up Glenn's uh, federal investigation form, and it turned out, I got down to one thing, said, have you ever been a member of any, uh, the Communist Party or the Ku Klux Klan or any other group that seeks to overthrow the government of the United States or to fom foment uh, domestic disturbances, et cetera, et cetera? Don't remember the exact thing, and it's a pro forma, and everybody usually says no. And Glenn Riddell had, yes, Ku Klux Klan, 
something county, Georgia or Alabama, 1934-1939, see FBI file number such and such. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, Mr. Riddell, I, you know, I don't want to be nosy, but this is really intriguing to me. Uh, do you remember the Ku Klux Klan? And he said, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I was. I was a young county agent back then. I ended up down here in Georgia, Alabama. And uh, I was approached by the Ku Klux Klan, and this was back in the 20s and 30s when they were really strong. And what I did is I went and had a long discussion with the school principal and a charismatic young minister. And we decided, why not? We joined the Ku Klux Klan. We ran for and were elected president, vice president, and secretary treasurer, respectively. And under our guiding administration, the Ku Klux Klan of such and such county did absolutely nothing for the next six years. And and he ended up, you know, the rest of his life he had to put. Had this, to say he was in the Ku Klux. Yeah, yeah, but he was, was. He was. But he did it. Looked at it from a different reason. Well, we kept Anderson out at the hospital for about a week and uh, went around and people started putting their stories together at this time and discovered the guy really was crazy. And We took six hour turns sitting out there with the guy. We had some aid personnel that would go out there and you had to physically sit and watch the guy or he'd do things like break all the panes of the glass out of the window with his fist and, and you had to keep him doped up on medication. And uh, Finally, they put him on a, a special flight and flew him down to Udon, and they had a place there, and they flew him back to the United States. He, uh, he loved to play cards, and he was always betting things like his watch and stuff like this, and, and you'd always insist on playing for matches, and, and the, the guy just had problems. Mm. Of course, Joe Flipsy always said it was because he saw the financial system and realized it was the best way to go back to the United States. So we shipped him back to the United States, and then I got a rather unhappy letter as to what had happened to this item and this item and this item, you know, that had not been with his clothing. And I wrote a rather semi-nasty letter back to the effect, it was clenched teeth, actually, I was polite, but his shoes, when last seen, he was washing them out with soap <laughs> in puddles in the middle of the road, his watch. He used to bet this when he was playing cards, and it, while it was on him when he left for Udorn, it is to be believed that he got into playing with U.S. Army personnel in the hospital in Udorn. His jacket, I don't know what happened to his jacket, how should I know? <laughs> so that was his episode, and then later on we had another financial officer come, and he started trying to set the chaos to right. So those were some of the early days of IVS. The only other thing I can remember that was really interesting is we put these teams together and had them start working out in the field. Uh, and uh, what was your relations uh, with uh, USAID in those USAID in those early days? Well, USAID was there, and we worked close with them and alongside with them, and uh, part of them uh, we sometimes referred to ourselves as the USA Coolies, but uh, that's the way it worked. I mean, we had a house on the USA compound, which was our offices. We got our supplies from USA. We got the equipment from USA. We got our direction from USA. Mm -hmm. um, occasionally, like the time that we, well, Bob got a, uh, the Minister of Cults came in to visit once and I think was with the knowledge of USAID, but it was not the sort of thing that AID would get. They, they were more involved with their more uppity ranks of the uh, uh, bureaucracy in, in Laos, whereas we were more down with the people. And Bob once got succeeded in getting the team together for a team meeting in the main living room of this uh, office that would have been a house. And he had a man set up there Brilliant monk's uniform, the you know, robes and everything, very distinguished looking gentleman. And he had a, a translator who kept looking at him oddly and looking at us oddly. And he was explaining Buddhism and the role of Buddhism in the life of the people of Laos. And we began to 
kind of go to sleep because it was such a hot day and the fan wasn't doing too well. And it was only 103 or something like that, you know, and sort of like this. And the translator would wait until he'd finished and then tell us what he had said. And then he'd speak some more. And we were all pretty much this way. And the, the chief monk then says, let Pachabani Kapachal Kutva, as I understand, the main basis behind the Christian religion is that everyone has sinned and that you have to spend your entire life making up for doing the sin uh, and trying to set it right. And we suddenly realized that it was this man, not the translator, who was speaking. He allowed us to all go to sleep listening to Lao, and now he was just sort of launching into English. You know, it's kind of a little one-upsman thing. Now, I never heard of anything like this being done with AID. The aid people were our guides, our mentors, and they uh, set up the program, and we worked it out with them. Uh, the emphasis was on rural and village work where we would go. <clears throat> but many times we were used basically as the, uh, we didn't quite get to the coolie status, mm -hmm. but the, a lot of the programs came down that we did not really feel were as organized as they should be. However, having a good time in the villages, the IBSers had a good time and, uh, and carried out the programs as best they could with the local people and the local populace, but it was not their way to, they could look around and say, we could put some wells in and do this and make a suggestion to the AID man, and then it'd go up and they'd draft activity plans and we'd come to, they'd come down and do it. But I remember one year when uh, we had a vegetable growing program. There aren't enough vegetables in the market. The vegetables all come across the river from Thailand illegally. We have to grow vegetables in Laos. So next thing, we were all over the country planting vegetables, handing out vegetable seeds. This is the uh, the year that I ended up in Wom, which is northern Laos. I was getting kind of bored with the administration, and I moved up to northern Sayaburi province and was up there approximately six months. And we had vegetable seeds, and we, one, two, three, it was either I think it was four of us lived in a room about this size, maybe two feet wider. One one room, tin roof, and uh, we flew in on an airplane and uh, set up shop, and people would come to see us as we went out in the village and put up bulletin boards and, and got little programs going, dug wells basically, but then we got the vegetable seeds, and they would all show up, and we were we were uh, spooning out vegetable seeds for them in little plastic bags, and I made a, drew up a little label in Lao and had a picture of the vegetable. We'd slide in and we'd seal it over a candle and we handed out our own vegetable seeds. And everybody was missed. Well, beans, no problem. Corn, no problem. Celery? What's celery? Well, we called it maxelari, you know, phonetic spelling and everything. Try it. You know, it's hard to grow in the States. Maybe you can grow it here. Well, dutifully, everybody came back about six to eight weeks later bringing these huge bundles of uh, string beans as a return for all those great bean seeds we gave them and to indicate, nope, celery hadn't worked at all. Anybody else getting <laughs> Celery never did grow in that area as far as I know. But then you go to a meeting in Vientiane and they'd say, now, this year we're going to be doing a pig program. And I, I said, excuse me, uh, what about the vegetable program? Aren't we going to do a survey of the success and failures of the program? No, Galen, you don't understand. This year we're doing a pig program, i.e., let's sweep it under the rug. Let's not, let's not check on the past success or failure. We've got a new program, and that's going to be the concentration. Why would that happen? I mean, other than just bureaucratic insanity, generally. You can't gain any benefit about looking back as to successes or failures okay. because there's a chance you have this failure. You right. know? Okay. Whereas you come up with a new program, you're going on the advice of some experts who just flew in from the States, mm -hmm. and they're going to tell you how to raise better pigs. Mm -hmm. um, part of it was, I think, a little frustration came with the IBSers because the IBSer is out in the village talking with the villagers. Mm -hmm. 
and knows what's happening on the local level and what he can do with them and what he can't do with them and, and how to approach things. And then he's talking to somebody who's got three degrees from agricultural colleges in the United States who's worked all over the world. And it's very simple. You go in and you tell them what to do and they do it, you know, and you're saying, wait a minute, this guy's not going to listen. You just change immediately from his old agriculture to IRA rice. You're asking him to give up rice that his father had and his grandfather had and his great grandfather. And you want to have him stake 100% of the family income on planting his little hectare of land in this rice he's never seen before. And, uh, you know, if it grows, he's fine. But if it doesn't, he's dead. And he knows that. What's going to happen is you're going to find one guy in each village. And he's going to be, you know, bright-eyed little Joe. And little Joe is going to get a little area. And he's going to plant the rice. And everybody's going to come around. And they're going to look at this rice. And they're going to watch it grow. And they're going to compare it. And they're going to harvest it. And they're going to eat it and check out the taste and flavor. And if it works, the next year, some of them may plant it in addition to the regular rice. But everybody's not going to plant a hectare of it the first year just because the government says plant it. And, well, Galen, you don't understand the situation. They've got to plant more rice. I mean, yeah, I mean, it was very obvious that there was commands from on high mm -hmm. and logical resistance uh, from down below in some of these programs. And I think this was universal throughout the country. Where did you pick up your Lao language training? <laughs> I had picked up a little in Washington, D.C. from dear Jacqueline Rodriguez, mm -hmm. who taught me how to say words such as Sabaidi, which is actually from an old American song called Sabaidi Loves Me, I Wonder Who. <laughs> no, that's a very bad term. Lao is very good for puns, though, and you can make glaring mistakes in the Lao language, and they love it because it changes the meaning of all the words. Uh, you know, it would be uh, akin to somebody from Laos trying to find the implements on his table and looking for the fork and pronouncing it wrong. Everybody gets a smile on their face. Nobody wants to correct it. Um, and I, when I first went to Vientiane, I just started walking down the streets at night and I'd find a little restaurant and I'd sit there and I had a little black book and I would Ani Men Yang or actually I started out Ani Men Yang and everybody go <laughs> Ani Men Yang oh okay Ani Men Yang and I'd write down Ani Men Yang and they'd say Gail and I'd say Gail and I'd write down drinking glass and then I'd think about it, and I'd say, is this scale? Gale, gale, men gale. Men, that means is. And I started writing, putting together the, the language as I wrote. Mm -hmm. Okay, come, i show you. No, come with me. Oh, I, I have to actually come with me. Okay, just push off. I'll show you. Oh, okay. So you just taught yourself. Yeah, I just taught myself. But I'd say, what is this, and what is that, and began to work out the vocabulary, and... and uh, I would spend two or three days sometimes trying to figure out all of the possible permutations of certain words. The hardest thing, well, one thing is the Lao language is a little bit different in English. You say, uh, in English, you say, where is the dog? In Lao, you say, uh, animal dog is, exist where? You know, I mean, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's reversed. And uh, the hardest thing to learn was the classifiers. Uh, which is when you are using numbers, you don't say, I see three elephants. You say, I see elephant three animal. Uh, uh, there are four airplanes. And you would say, uh, is uh, boat fly four and then your classification on the end would be cylinder or long cylindrical objects into which airplanes and logs have the same category mm -hmm. or classification. Mm -hmm. So, and that's that was the hardest thing to figure out. And the Lao themselves confess sometimes. I give them a word, and they confess they didn't know which one it is. And they just give me kind of a general, a generic one. And so I had to had to figure out twenty or thirty classifiers. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, no, I, I basically taught myself. There was there was a U.S. Army course, uh, which is about a two-year course, mm -hmm. and nobody ever wanted to part with their book. We could never get any, and there were some tapes, and I did play the tapes uh, when I was in Washington, just play them in the evening, and just hear mm -hmm. the language, but I never learned more than a dozen words that way. So you, you, you arrived there in... 1962. 62. 62. And you spent how, how long in IBS? Uh, total, if you count from Washington, D.C., I was in IBS from November of 1959 until December of 1966. I okay, remember but, one but, time a man in uh, Vietnam and I were, you know, jesting that each one of us was seeing who could be there the longest. Mm -hmm. But when you, you arrived in, La, uh, in Laos in 1962 yeah. uh, to be the assistant uh, assistant manager, so to speak. Well, yeah, the program. So gonna, was... and then, but that was in 62, and then you stayed there with IBS until 66. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, during that time, did you notice any changes in the programs or the, the administration or official relationships? Well, the one great... Uh, difference between the programs came in 1967 or 8 after I left IBS, mm -hmm. which was at the time that a number of IBSers had come under fire, literally. And there was a pulling back on the part of a large segment of the IBS community as to, hey, we're in the middle of the war and we shouldn't be here until everything is safe and we can do our work. Or mm -hmm. it is worthless to try a program when everything gets shot up. Mm -hmm. And so they started uh, uh, ending up with some unhappiness of this. There was a large meeting in the uh, AID mess hall or auditorium, movie theater was where they had the meeting and it was Basically, one argument was a group that was getting gradually uh, pro-left on, let's get out of here, this is a bad war, IBS should not be here at all. And the other group was, we are here and we can do a job uh, despite the war. And then there was a group that, usually the very quiet types, it didn't say much, ended up uh, leaving IBS and joining, well, it was put down as AID, but it really wasn't. Mm -hmm. And they all became spooks. And uh, there were not a lot of them. I mean, those are very, very far right. But they just went from IBS into that uh, aspect of it. Um, In other words, they kind of said, we don't want to be part of this debate. We want to continue. We want to do what? Well, no, there, the, well, there was, was there one group that said, we can stay here and we can make a difference. Within there was a the group far to the left, one or two of them said, I, I can't stand this, I'm leaving, there's mm -hmm. death and dying, and, mm -hmm. and we're becoming war, and we're in the middle of the uh, thing. Then there was a very far left group which said, we are uh, unhappy with the things where, the way things are going out, it's a bad war, but we will stay here and check mm -hmm. it all out. The mm -hmm. primary example being Fred Braslin. Right. Mm -hmm. we can talk I'm going to stay here and who most of the IBSers I know didn't have really high regard for him because he didn't do anything. Well, I want to and talk about Fred right now for a second. But, but, but I, that was an example right. on the left side. Exactly. Then you had the other side mm -hmm. who very quietly moved out of IBS, and even uh, some of them were trying to get the IBSers to the left of them to move more to the right for God and country. We're going to go out and show the, the good royalist Lao uh, people how to plant rice despite the uh, uh, attacks of the godless communists. Exactly. I want to focus on those people for a minute because I've sure heard enough about the other folk and we're going to talk a lot about those other on folk. On the left too. or the right? Uh, I, we've ta I, I know a lot about the folk on the left. I mm -hmm. know nothing about the people on the right. Okay. Uh, there was one guy, I'm not sure, that he, I think he started in Vietnam and then right, uh, later on moved to uh, Doris. He later on to uh, Laos. Okay, you can write a check later on, not now. I think the guy's name was Burke Ritchie. 
He had kind of reddish hair and a little red mustache, and he, I'd have to trace down his uh, background, but he, I believe he started with IBS in Vietnam and then came to Laos, but by the time he got to Laos, he was no longer IBS. He was AID, and uh, he drove a little MG sports car, and I did not know where he worked or what he did, and he was listed as being part of the agricultural section or something like this in the phone book, and you knew who he worked for. But he, for. Was, with US, he was with USAID. No, he was a spook. No, no, that's But it was in the book under that. Yeah, but, but he wasn't attached with IBS when he was in Laos. No. I, I'm interested. Uh, let me explain why. Okay. I don't like explaining yeah. why, because your memory is more valuable yeah. when I don't prompt it, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's, I guess we'll have to get right into it, and, and, and we, can, we can come back to this later, too. Uh, during the war, there was a book by, uh, by Adams and McCoy. It was a series of, of articles about Laos and uh, Alfred McCoy, who's uh, still teaching in Wisconsin. And there was an article by a guy named, I think it was Jack Llewellyn, and it was called The uh, uh, Reluctant Counterinsurgents. Yeah. And I'm in that. You're in that. I'm sure you are, actually. I've got a paragraph about yeah, that about long, that long. quoted from one of my newsletters. And then since then, uh, was it Roger Warner has mm -hmm. written a book, Backfire. Uh, personally, I think that uh, just as a historian, I like to create an awful lot of distance between what you're writing about and what you think yourself, and never to start out a work with a presumption of what yeah. it is that you're going to find. And I found both those pieces, both, both those sources are simply arguments in defense of a point that I think was decided before the Okay, I see your point, yeah. And so for a historian, I got to go, I want to go over that, that same ground with you for your opinion of those things. Mm -hmm. And you can say, well, I, it's just my opinion, or, well, that's the way it looked to me, or I never saw this conflict. That's fine, because I, 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 I'm more interested in that. I felt that uh, both those sources just uh, kind of, uh, well, I asked Fred, for example. He, 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 it just slipped out of his, his mouth, uh, you know, uh, you know, spooks using IBS for cover, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. And I said, did you, did you ever know of anyone who, uh, who used IBS for cover in that way? And he said, no, I didn't. He said, it's just a hearsay. Well, he, no, he, I mean, no, he, that, said, he, was very, he was very correct on that because, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would camp, come back to the United States and people would kind of look me over and, you know, occasionally somebody would say, you guys are all in the CIA, are you? But uh, I don't know of any case. I know where IBSers worked very closely with people that we did not feel that they would be associating with. Mm -hmm. But uh, we did not feel that one came in through IBS uh, using it as cover, because it would have been kind of obvious. They would come in, and they would be living in two houses down, but it was a different atmosphere. Absolutely. Well, yeah. the point is, Fred, and Fred said yeah. that, that is he, it was, but, but it was a kind of thing which Fred could say to Roger Warner, and mm -hmm. Roger Warner would say, aha, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Instead of checking it out or asking Fred the obvious question, which was, name one. Yeah. And, of course, Fred retracted it. He said, you know, that's true. I, I never knew anyone yeah. uh, who did that. That was a, a kind of just a rumor. And so, But the problem is there's so much in those two sources mm -hmm. that are like that. We could spend, and I'm afraid we're going to have to, spend a whole day just talking about that to straighten out the record because the record is so muddy by those things. But the one issue was that uh, I think maybe Fred said, maybe a few other people said, that there were, there were some people in IBS, perhaps because of their religious backgrounds, who when they got to Laos and realized there was a war, felt because of a religious heritage that they needed to be there to fight communism. And Llewellyn picked up on them and made it sound like a lot of IBS people, and by the way, I've not met any, uh, yeah, felt a know. calling to stop communism in Laos when they realized that IBS could perform that function. That they said, well, that's good. That's a function that we should do as much as we can. Well, the Christianity versus communism aspect never was per se. I mean, somebody might say, you know, these communists are attacking and they're killing all these people and they are good people. They're just like the people I knew back in Indiana and we got to help them. Mm -hmm. But it wouldn't be presented as Christianity versus mm -hmm. communism. Mm -hmm. 
uh, you you ended up with a lot of people who felt the on the Christianity versus communism things. I remember once I had a a uh, little Greek fisherman's hat, and I picked up a uh, mouth button, and I stuck it on the front. And uh, there was a guy talking to me on an airline, you know. I mean, the pilot looked at me odd, and the co-pilot looked at me oddly, and I was flying up from Savannah Cat to the Incheon. And uh, it was just the way they put it. It was, you know, a lot of people dying because of that thing that you're boasting about. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ended up, you know, quietly taking it off. Mm -hmm. Those 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 people were IBS people. No, they were all pilots and, right, and right. so on. Then another time, I uh, I subscribed to Rampart's magazine because mm-hmm. uh, it was it was kind of interesting, and I can remember. You see, we got our our, our uh, mail through the APO, mm-hmm. and you went over and you had a box there, and then you pick up whatever mail, or they give it to you, or so on. And and the, uh, the guy who was doing the mail uh, handed me my mail and. Said a lot of people don't think much of that magazine. It's like communist literature, and I realized he hated my guts just because I was receiving that magazine. Mm-hmm. And it was—it wasn't so much him. It was just the—I uh, began to realize how things were going in the United States, mm-hmm. you know, because of that little aspect. Well, is there is there? Uh, well, of course, the thing is that you—you you know, it's funny because you do remember so much when when you. Uh, if I can roll you around a specific event sure. in the Big period nice. up to 66. Uh, but uh, the, the wonderful thing about your experience is that they're so early. Yeah. But of course, the result of that is we know the least about that period. From 66 onward, there are an awful lot of IBS people that oh, yeah. participate in the soil history, but they were there after 66. Because uh, in, when you were there, uh, what is it? Uh, Dongook hadn't been built, mm-hmm. so there wasn't the school wasn't there to you know to have this kind of oh Dongook yeah what did you say Dongook <laughs> okay I yeah. said Duk when I was saying no, no. Vietnamese uh, well, no okay. no oh yeah that's true Dung that Dung may Dung be Dung it Dung. because I I don't know any Lao and I know a <laughs> precious little Vietnamese but yeah uh, the uh, because of the uh, because of that there's I and mean, you've been filling it in quite nicely mm-hmm. actually the those administrative uh, Things and perhaps later when we uh, we see what we're missing for that early period, we mm-hmm. can come back to you and say, you know, can you help us with this? Uh, was so and so there? Oh, yeah. But but you did know Pop Buell because Fair Pop, enough, Pop yeah. was there. So uh, uh, how did you get well, to know okay, him better? Well, okay, Pop was there yeah. when we arrived, mm-hmm. and by this time he was already a legend. I mean, this was 1962, and I believe it was uh, uh, in the month that I arrived, or the next one, these two articles came out in the Saturday Evening Post called An American Hero by Don Sanchez, S-A-C-H-E, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. He was a veteran newsman who worked in these last years for the LA Times, and I believe he died in Florida about a year ago. Hmm. Um, I was always going to call him and get him to sign my next book, and never did. Anyway. You want to get that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's but, but again, uh, probably if we go, if uh, uh, oh wait, I wanted to, the re- we're in Laos. first meeting with Pop Buell. Okay, um, I had seen him here and there in in, in Vientiane, and and having known all of these IBSers that passed through the system, mm-hmm. it was inter- and it has always been interesting because living in Laos for ten years, I became a kind of a fixture on the landscape, mm-hmm. and uh, I knew all the people. And they only knew me in fragment form. For example, right. I sat at a, day, a table in the ACA once, mm-hmm. and uh, I had uh, two guys sitting here. And after about 20 minutes of discussion, one of them said, I don't believe we've met, and introduced himself to the other. And then I got really embarrassed because it turned out this one lived in Park and this one lived in Bon Louisai, And I know them both well, but they'd never met. Mm-hmm. And so to make up for it, a couple of weeks later, I introduced the two guys at the table and turned out they were roommates for the last six months. So, you know, it balances out. Mm-hmm. But Pop was there, and I think the second or third day when we were still bleary eyed from the trip across the Pacific and Hong Kong and all that, that we met Pop and we sat there in the uh, ACA. And um, 
we had recruited a rather tall, tall, gangly farm boy with an accent who I he felt he was okay on the farm. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. He had an agricultural degree. He lives down in in uh, San Diego, but he 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 brought along a western hat and boots and belt buckle because that's what the Lao are really going to be interested in. He affected this big. Texas drawl, although he'd never gone to Texas, he just, he was sort of a character. And we sat at a table and we were talking with Pop and they were interested in some of these experiences and he was just telling about the Hmong people and how he was working with them. And he said, now don't tell anybody or say anything, but that man sitting over the table there is one of the, probably the biggest spooks in Laos, if not all of Southeast Asia, and just pretend you don't see him or anything. And he talked for about five or six more minutes, and then he had to leave, and he said bye, you know, and he headed up and went out the door. Whereupon this IVSer, new to the country, gets up and says, well, I'm kind of interested in finding out what's going on. And he went over, sat himself down at the table, and said, hi, I'm so-and-so, and I work for IVS. Have you been in the country long? And all of us are going, you know, I mean, you accepted the way things were, right. and he had just breached the covenant, so mm -hmm. to speak. Uh, the the articles had come out on Pop by this time, and he was becoming famous. You know, people, you know, Pop. Yeah, you know, you know I, what's he doing now? Where is he? Nobody knows. He disappeared for six weeks. He's up country, and they think he's in some little valley and all this. It was it was quite dramatic and all that. And I always took it with a grain of salt, and I had a group of Hmong refugees, somehow I'd been at the airport and somebody said, can you take this group into the compound? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't know how. They ended up in my uh, Jeep, CJ6, it was longer than CJ3Bs. Mm -hmm. And I drove into the compound and as I went up to the water tower, here's Pop walking back from the uh, ACA towards his little office. And everybody's starts patting my arm and pointing and pointing, come pop, come pop. Well, it, I didn't speak that much loud, but I knew they wanted to talk to pop. So I pull over to a stop and everybody piles out. Pop's talking to the wife. He's bouncing the baby in his arms and they're looking at him with this look of absolute adoration and praise. He's patting the eight-year-old on the head and watching the six-year-old talking to him in this really bad Lao, which I didn't even know yet. And uh, turned and he said, nice baby, isn't it? This one was a breech birth. It was a real difficult presentation. But you know, delivering babies is just like delivering calves, except it's a little easier because you can talk with the mother. And he bounced the kid a bit and kept, and they kept looking. And I believed every word of it after that. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just one of these little vignettes. Mm -hmm. um, where were we? Uh, we were, we just started when you first met, when you very first met Pop Yo for the first time. Oh, in Washington, D.C.? No, in, uh, and you got to Yeah, yeah, I just came back and met him for the first time then. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, later on in 1960, oh, let's see, I went to work at Southern Laos, of Servan, and I was, then it was in Pakse and Savannah Cat and King Tart, and, and came up back up to Vientiane and began to work with a group called Agricultural Development Organization. And uh, it was it was taken over basically by people who were being rift or re reduced in force from Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. And uh, my boss, who was really interested in Ben and Laos, was replaced with somebody with seniority and aid. And uh, then this guy started bringing in a friend of his from Costa Rica and suddenly everything, nothing was working with Lao anymore. It was all the organization men were getting in on the thing. So I got a little uh, antsy and didn't see any future in this thing, the way things were going. And I mentioned it to Carol, who was, remember Carol, who was uh, working in our office in Washington? Right, Vegas. right. Uh -huh. She came to Laos and started working with Pop. And she'd been there three, four years. Carol worked in Laos? Yeah. T-Bone State, Carol? Carol Mills? No, no, we, we haven't talked about her yet.
<laughs> well, the way it worked is in 1961, I recruited a guy for IBS known as Harold Daigler. Mm -hmm. uh, he, had, he was a minister and had a degree in electrical engineering and uh, did international tour groups to Brussels for the World Fair, if you can imagine that combination. And we had a farewell dinner for him. And the secretary at the office, Carol, who had been in my BBS unit, brought her sister. And her sister looked at Harold, and Harold looked at her, and given the fact she was 17 and he was like uh, 29 or 30, bingo. I mean, I've heard about this, never believed it. He drove to see her in West Virginia uh, for the next six weeks. And then he went to Laos, she flew to Laos and married him, and then I went to Laos, and a year or two later, Carol came to Laos. And Carol began to work with, she was there partially because her sister was there. Mm -hmm. And she began to work with Pop, and she was up at Sam Tong, oh my, three, four, five years maybe. And things were getting a little bit hot up there to the point where they didn't know if they wanted a uh, slightly overweight lady who was very charming, but uh, <laughs> might have trouble running and jumping on airplanes. Mm -hmm up there anymore. It's getting that hot. And so they, Carol knew me and knew that I really didn't relate with the administration of the Agriculture Development Organization anymore. And, and so she worked it out with Pop and I went up and started taking her place. Uh, and it was only a month after that, uh, that Sam Tong fell, which was, you know, pretty good timing actually. I never, I wasn't up there for more than a month, month and a half, something like that. I'd have to look up the dates. So that's, that's how Carol got in it. But, but I worked up there with Pop, uh, you know, as his uh, chief sidekick on the administrative details. Mm -hmm. uh, took care of the payroll, uh, you know, the, the administrative function, got supplies and equipment when necessary, uh, took the tourists, uh, or took the journalists actually, mm -hmm. that came on little trips around the airfield and the refugee camps and translated for them. And, uh, ran the Vientiane office. You know, when they needed something, they'd call up from San Tong and I'd be in Vientiane and I'd get it and meet him at the airport or whatever. So, you know, I got to know Pop fairly well because I was in this capacity for over two years. But, uh, let's see, when you, since you, you, uh, just to keep the chronology straight for the people who listen to the tape, you arrive in Laos in 62, you stay in IBS until 66? Yeah, December 31st. I right. think a nice round figure like that. Did you uh, did you ever did you ever work with Pop between 62 and 66? When does Pop leave IBS? Pop got there in 1960, probably in 1960 61 or 62. He transferred over and began working for AIB. AIB. And it was, it made sense the type of work he was doing. It was like when I ended up in, uh, in Northern Laos, mm -hmm. they hired a group of AID, hired a group of interns from Peace Corps, Nepal and elsewhere, mm -hmm. outgoing Peace Corps people, mm -hmm. hired them, sent them up to me for training. Mm -hmm. And I'm training these guys. They haven't been in the country before. They don't know the language and they're getting paid four times as much as I am. Mm -hmm. So it was obvious that sooner or later I might as well cross and become AID, mm -hmm. and uh, I, you know, did so several years later. It was kind of an odd position to be in. It's like being an interpreter for a, a area coordinator who is an absolute idiot when mm -hmm. it comes to knowing the local customs and trying to explain it to him very politely in English what he's supposed to do, and trying to cover for him with a uh, governor of one of the provinces who thinks he's an absolute idiot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, let's. The, 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 this could be interesting. Why don't we look at it this way? Uh, uh, getting away from from pop fuel, really, because what, one of the things that. Uh, well, why don't we talk about it for one more minute? One of the things I'm trying to be interested in is I want to separate pop fuel, the IBSer, from pop fuel, the AID man. Yeah, pop. Because because people try to. Forget that, you know, they try to blend those things together. Pop was, Pop difference. went over with IBS, but he is not really known as an IBS because mm -hmm. he spent, he went into AID and stayed there until, uh, you know, for the next 12 years, mm -hmm. whatever. 
Uh, Pop was there when he arrived in what, June 1960 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And by 1961 or 62, he was completely AID. I don't know at what point mm -hmm. uh, they, there just began to be an arrangement where they sat down and talked over it, and he transferred directly over to AID because he was doing all these programs that an IBSer would never end up with. Now, why would an IBSer never end up with those programs? Uh, he had this uh, charisma and uh, a way of doing things that a young, wet-behind-the-ear college graduate couldn't get away with. He'd done all these things in Indiana. He'd been a family man. He'd run a farm. Uh, he never got beyond the eighth grade. When he talked to Lau, they looked at him uh, as a fellow farmer and a rather decent human being. And besides, he was about as tall as they were and about the same color. Mm -hmm. I mean, they related to him. Mm -hmm. he, he was not the typical IBSer. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of uh, obvious to everybody that, you know, you're bringing an aid man who's 10 years younger than he is. He's not going to listen to what this guy says or else he's going to tell him off. He, he operated uh, independently because he saw needs that needed to be done. And uh, everybody recognized this and put him in a position where he could operate mm -hmm. that way. Yeah, that does help clarify something. Yeah. Uh, as far as the work he was doing for USAID in the in the northern provinces, the way the when I've been interviewing people, mm. there does seem to be there's, in other words, it's almost as if there's a a, a different there are two countries. Oh yeah. And and I'm trying to understand how IVS relates to that separation of northern and southern Laos, a kind of a, a boat of peace and a boat of war, neither of which of course would be exactly true. Well, but you have how, how would how would, uh, when you were there, when you were still in IBS, how did you perceive that? It was the highlands and the lowlands. Lands. You didn't perceive it. It was there, you were aware of it, but you never sat down and consciously tried to think about it. Mm -hmm. You had the lowland Lao farmers who raised rice. They were all related. They got into periodic, noisy, but largely bloodless wars. Um, and then you had a northern group who came basically from outside the country around 1850, had been around for about a uh, hundred and some years, who were fierce nomadic uh, warriors living on the mountaintops, uh, wanted nothing uh, other than maybe a little trade with the people in the lowland, and they were trying to protect their way of life, and they grew rice and uh, pigs and opium and children, and uh, they wanted to be free and uh, maintain their own way of life. So you had basically two different programs going on. Whereas the guy in the living in the villages might end up in a village house that's 200 years old, dancing with the mayor's daughter, uh, running a rice program and pumping water. The guy in the mountains was much more likely to uh, be helping people who'd been in the area only 10 years. They'd been refugees three times and they were more involved in safety, clothing, food, and shelter. Mm -hmm. uh, so you had two different little empires, so to mm -hmm. speak, build up, or areas of work. Mm -hmm. But what about the forward area? Okay. How did that evolve? Well, this is what was called the forward area team, mm -hmm. and I was on the first forward area team that went out. We called ourselves Fat Men. Mm -hmm. It was not a really <laughs> <laughs> forward area team. team. Right, right. We figured it out. Right. Okay. Yeah. And in 19... 65, a rather charismatic colonel, Colonel Hafner. Mm -hmm. They call him Half Track behind his back. Mm -hmm. He was a really interesting guy. He was about 56, and he had retired from the Army. Uh, he joined when he was about 14 or something, and he'd been in, they'd tell the stories about Nicaragua in the 19, uh, late 1930s, and uh, you know, being down in Caribbean islands and so on. Mm -hmm. And he got up to uh, Laos and came in working. And they, they felt, first of all, you had the, the groups that were working along with the villages. And uh, in, along the Mekong River. And then you had the mountain groups. And then you had this kind of a nebulous area where things weren't quite as safe as being in the local fixed villages. Mm -hmm. Because as you start putting in civilization, so to speak, and moving outwards, you're running into the uh, group, the 
Pathet Lao, which is unhappy with the government, wants to reform the entire government by turning it over. And so they decided what they needed was forward area teams. And uh, there were about, oh, let's see, there was two to four of us, I guess, in the first team, two Americans and, and two Lao translator, interpreter, assistants, whatever. Mm -hmm. And we ended up flying up to northern Siberia province, a little place called Xiang Lom. Now, Xiang Lom is a uh, little valley which is to the is to the west of Laos. But if you look at the map, Laos is shaped like a pork chop. Mm -hmm. There's a little area down there which the sun rises and sets in Thailand, but you're still in Laos. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of little angle down in mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And in this valley is known as Xiang Lom and Xiang Xiang Hom. Would you spell that for the tape? X I E N G L O M. And uh, there was, we arrived there and there was basically an airstrip and there was a, a rather long western built house uh, or I don't know how to describe it. It was kind of a long office administration building. People slept in one area and had dug out privies in the far side and, and next to it was this little cabin that had been the original one which was just a little bit bigger in this room. It had a tin roof, four windows in the door and uh, and a little privy out behind it. And that probably was the first one. And this had been built, as far as we know, by the spooks, who then later had paid all the money to put in this big, long building, mm -hmm. which was, you know, about three feet off the ground, but it was, oh, I don't know, it was maybe uh, 200 feet long, and it was fairly wide and had a long uh, balcony running along the front. And uh, here's where the Thai teams were. And it was explained to us when we worked up that we did our thing and they did their thing and don't worry about who they are or where they come from or where they go. And I guess it had been a forward staging area for them and then they started going out in the hills and they decided it was time to bring in a AID forward area team. And we were to make friends with the villagers, to find out what they wanted in the way of the programs and to do things such as wells, dams and agriculture mm -hmm. and education. And oh, I was up there maybe nine or ten months, I'd have to check it out. And we got going in all of these things. Mm -hmm. And uh, we discovered, well, one thing that we discovered, the area was so far away from anywhere that everybody liked us because they all hated the local, uh, let's see, Chao Muang. And Chao Muang is the lowest level official appointed by the the government. Well, could you spell that for the tape? C H A O M O U A N G. And uh, Chao Muang, uh, the Chao Muang was from elsewhere. Uh -huh. And he hated this job. Uh -huh. And his wife hated him. And I remember the day when he, he tolerated us, but you could tell he was like a Roman patrician who'd been inside. Uh, exile to Siberia. He just hated it up there and he, you know, treated the villagers like dirt and they didn't think too much of him either. I can remember the day his, uh, the villagers came rushing to tell us, guess what? The Chao Mung and his wife got in an argument and he kicked her in the head. Well, the head is the highest part of the human body and uh, the soul and so on, right? and, and his foot is his lowest. And, right. oh, that was an absolute insult to her and so the next morning she was down at the airport and sat there three days with all of her luggage waiting until she found a plane that would get away from her husband but everybody loved this gossip. The, uh, we went out and we started putting in the projects. Uh, we had uh, the Doug Well program which was one of the big IBS programs. Uh, one of the guys made a uh, metal form and you would put uh, uh, cement around in between the two metal forms and you put uh, bamboo with wire wired together in there and you'd stamp in concrete and you'd end up with a metal ring about this big and about six inches diameter and you'd dig a hole about 50 feet down and you'd lower this damn thing clear down to the problem uh, to the bottom and I have pictures of myself clad in the loincloth and the turban going down with the villagers and mucking out all the dirt and having an absolutely muddy, wonderful time with them. And I think they liked us because military didn't do this, the government didn't do this, you know, we were out there and 
discussing ways and means of putting in stuff. And we would sit around the campfires at night, have discussions with the, the villagers. We went out in the villagers, we put up uh, rice pallets of, of plywood, and we had a newspaper that we started tacking up, just kind of carry it in the pack when you went out to see what was happening. You'd put it up, and I got kind of intrigued in the entire thing and ended up drawing a map of the entire area, putting on the location of every village, uh, visiting every village, getting the history as far as I could of each one of the villages, and what was going on, and the, who lived there, and who ran the thing, and uh, and how it went. He was writing a socio-economic history of the entire thing. Mm -hmm. Ended up about, oh, I don't know, 14, 16 pages, something like this, and double, or single spaced. And, and I had a good time doing it, and uh, just did it for the fun of it, and submitted it one time, and they just buried it, and put it in the USAID library. And, uh, wrote up about all the programs and how things went on. I can remember sitting around the campfire one night and they started asking, you know, are you married? How many children do you have? <laughs> and I made the comment, oh, they've been married, uh, my brother and his wife have been married two, two, three years now. How many children do they have? I said they uh, don't have any because they don't want to. Everybody stops and they say, <laughs> wait, wait, what is not wanting to have children have to do with not having children don't they well you know mm -hmm. I'm saying yeah but you know and then I learned the word birth control mm -hmm. you know uh, you know basically there's a little pill that she takes every morning oh, no kidding and doesn't have any kids and everything all right what do you know everybody's sitting there smoking these terrible loud cigars and sitting looking in the campfire and finally one of the younger kids says uh, where do you get these pills <laughs> And it turns out his wife has two children already, and, uh, you know, the whole valley's overpopulated, and there's no more land to get, and he's already thinking about the future of these kids. Mm -hmm. Another time we were sitting there, and we got to watching a satellite. They had a balloon. Remember when they floated the a balloon around the world up there? You could see this Dao Tiem, which means uh, twinkling star, actually, mm -hmm. or glittering star. Uh, going around the world, and they said, who does that belong to? And I said, what do you mean, who does it belong to? And they said, where have you been? Don't you know, there's the Americans and the Soviets, and they're in, they're in a race, and they got, each got these great big long rockets, and the race is to see who can build the most of them, and they ended up explaining the Cold War to me. You know, and I finally said, let's see, that's made in the USA. Yeah, that's one of ours, you know. <laughs> and they, they all chuckling because I was making like I could read the name on the site. But it was a nice place to relate to the people and you were going out in the villages and you'd pop by a month later and you'd see how the well was and talk over the people that built it. Uh, we'd fly down to Vientiane like once every two weeks or something, have a couple of days of R&R &R and fly back with some more supplies from the commissary. But we lived a lot on the local rice which was cheap and the beans which they were bringing us as a result of the the uh, vegetable programs. Mm -hmm. We had interesting experiences like building a bridge using old oil drums, discovering it doesn't work when the elephants use the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> getting, a, a getting a jeep with a dead battery stunk in the swamp and having that elephant pull you out of the swamp and being scared to death you were going to hit the horn while you were doing about 10 miles an hour with nothing but this huge butt in front of you pulling that jeep out of the mud. And, and it was it was very comfortable life. We had one of the guys, uh, Sam Adams, was one of these USAID interns, mm -hmm. and uh, he got very interested in the uh, fact that there was no dispensary, and ended up building a dispensary and getting from Dr. Weldon the the equipment and so on to staff it and finding a medic to go down there. Borrowed my interpreter, made a little speech. He had. 12 sentences in his speech, my interpreter had 11, and what he'd written down, <laughs> didn't know what to do when they got to the last sentence, because he was just reading what he <laughs> copied, but it was it was a very comfortable thing with the people. Uh, years later, just before I left Laos, um, well, they set up a num number of these forward area teams, I don't remember how many at the moment, but we were the first, and uh, the the biggest aspect we did with Hafner, he'd travel up every 
six weeks and stay overnight and see what was happening and disappear. And he was a nice, affable sort of person. Told us all these great stories of fighting in the Pacific in World War II. And, and uh, he and I and about five soldiers walked all the way from Xinglom up to the Mekong River. It was a three-day hike and we'd stay with villagers every night and sleep in the forest and go through rain. And so we decided there was, you know, 68 crossings of the river was a little bit expensive to put a road up. And that was made our report and that was it. And uh, that was basically the forward area team. It was oh. an extension of what we were doing in the Right. Cluster villages, uh -huh. uh, uh, village clusters, clusters concept right. down in the valley. Right, and now when you when you were you when you were in the first uh, forward area team, this was an IVS project. Uh, yeah, it was right. an IVS team known as a forward area. Forward team. area mm -hmm. team. Now, let's see if we can in the in the time remaining to us in the in the uh, in the Wellens article, and. If I don't. I, I didn't get anything out of this out of Roger Warner, but in, in the Llewellyn article, there there's an implicit for him. There's something implicit that is explicit. And Howard and I had a good time talking about this. I, IBS volunteers had a mission, which was to deliver what is essentially assistance uh, to communities in the cluster villages and in the forward area team. Mm -hmm. th there's just a, one mission. And that's to provide these these basic services and uh, stimuluses and aid. Yeah, grassroots development. Right. If if someone said to you, uh, "Don't you realize that this is just a counterinsurgency program? This is a nation building program that the USAID is doing to get these people to like their government, so they'll support the government in the war with the communists." Well, I would have said what, and, and it came out later in a different aspect with uh, the refugees, but in a situation like that, I would have said, look, the guys here are learning how to dig a well. I don't care where they dig the wells, but we're, we're giving them the training and experience so that someday they'll have clean drinking water and have better vegetables, and as far as I'm concerned, that benefits everybody. Now, you go out into the villages, and they say, Tonbiri, don't go that way. For a day or two, there was a report of a, an enemy patrol in that area. And uh, you say, fine, and you don't. And a week later, a couple of people come to you and you say, what's happening up there? Oh, it's no problem. You can go up there now. And, and you'd go along with them. And, and you trusted no, them. You had was, to trust yeah, them. There was no sense. But, there was no knowing how complex the situation with this, it was in Laos. Beyond that. There, there was. Did you ever feel that anyone or yourself ever had a positive feeling that what you're do, what you were doing, was necessarily part of some wider plan that you were furthering American interests or American interests in Laos? It was. I think we we knew that we were serving American interests in Laos, and in a way, you were ending up on. A definite side but you kept it at a level where uh, if if I were given Bibles or uh, anti-communist literature to distribute I would have been quite unhappy about it and would not have done it. Mm -hmm. I did differently in Malaysia but that's a different story. Mm -hmm. um, I would not have done this sort of things and some people were were super sensitive to this mm -hmm. sort of thing. Fred Brathman like right. What? Why is the U.S. government printing stuff on agriculture? The Lao have it already through the, through the PL. Mm -hmm. And I remember years ago he said that they had it. And I said, fine, can I get some copies? I'll go down and run off copies. Mm -hmm. Well, he never delivered. but He had them, but he never delivered because he simply didn't want the other side using them, which to me means that he kind of took He's sides already. Sides himself. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, I build a well, and anybody who wants to drink the water, fine. It's good. You learn the expertise, and in turn, you learn from them. And when you went into USAID, you know, this was just with IBS. Yeah. That you, you're, did, you, did you actually maintain those values, those same values? I mean, I assume you did to a certain extent, but what, what was... Uh, see, what I'm trying to do is establish... IBS mindset, and this is silly to say this because it's really artificial, but an IBS mindset and a USAID mindset. Obviously, in IBS, there, there's a whole ethos into what's going on. There's, it's, it's supposed to be non-governmental. Yeah. USAID is governmental. 
It depended yeah. on the IBS or the situation he was in. I give you an example. We had a guy by the name of Mac Thompson, mm -hmm. who is uh, about as uh, Republican, uh, government, uh, aggressively government as you can imagine. And he lived up in another valley up near ours named Hong Sa. Which is? H-O-N-G-S-A. And uh, he got in real close with the local colonel. And their idea of enjoyment was to get real drunk one afternoon and then commandeer the local C-47, get in it, go up to 3,000 feet and parachute. <laughs> and and uh, Chuck, uh, what was his name, Brown, the uh, chief of party at that time, an uh, older man who never had any kids and had trouble understanding him at times. He was really upset about this thing. And then later on, uh, Walt Coward was kind of unhappy about the same thing. So it was stuck to me to do something. So I ended up by drafting a document and going to him and then saying, hey, look, Mac, you got to sign this. What is it? I don't want to sign this. Why should I sign it? And it says, all it does is it releases IBS from any liability. If you're on your little forays up there with the local military and, and doing your, your crazy parachuting program, uh, he loved free falling. I mean, he was really into it years before anybody else. But it just, you know, it absolves them of any responsibility and it doesn't hurt you at all. And he says, what are you going to do with this? And I said, they're going to throw it in the file and forget it forever. But if, you know, you come down without opening your parachute, at least we get a piece of paper. And what they want. So he signed his name. I gave it to them. They put it in the file. Everybody was happy. Now, now that was one guy. He was on right in with the military. Right. You know, what are you doing? Oh, I'm going out target practicing with the major. Mm -hmm. My closest, uh, well, Colonel Hafner decided one afternoon that we should be, he was going to take us out. You know, he got to kind of grilling me as to I had any gun experience. And I said, uh, I've never shot a gun in my life. And, uh, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to get an M1. There's nothing beats an M1. He spoke on the glories of the M1 for about 10 minutes and said he was going to get some for each of us and, and uh, give us some target practice because this was, you know, this area was not, too, I said, well, it's a good idea, Colonel Hafner. Everybody kind of looked at me and Nobody wanted to get involved in this, even though all the guys that lived in the long building next door who all spoke fluent Thai, they looked Thai, they acted Thai, and they wore Thai shoes, you know. Uh, we ignored it. When we went over to see them, they had a big map, and they'd immediately cover the map up so we couldn't see the little red markings. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I said, Colonel Hafner, it's a great idea, but I've got a little worry about this. And he said, what's that? I said, well, first of all, I know the escape route. And uh, I think, you know, a gun might, if, if the thing is to get out as quickly as possible, I think I could travel faster without carrying a gun. The second thing, if I am caught, I would rather much be caught without a gun than with a gun. And third, I mean, look at us. With the training we have, I mean, we might shoot the wrong people real, real easy. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. And a couple weeks later, I was in ACA in Vientiane, and I was listening, and he was explaining to somebody at the next day, well, no, there's no way we're going to let forward area people carry guns. The reasons are, and he ticked them off, and they were all the same reasons. <laughs> well, you know, you got to use a little diplomacy in these things. Uh, when I, I, I was in an airplane coming back from Bon Sai one time. This is after I worked in AID. And it was one of these unmarked airplanes, and it stopped in an unmarked airfield, and they loaded all these rifles aboard. They were old M1s, and they were kind of beat up, and they needed a lot of work. And I immediately recognized them as, you know, somebody was sending back the guns to be repaired or from the dead soldiers or something. So I got the darn guns on the plane because it was a way to get the plane in the air. And then we, I guess we flew into to Luang Prabang, and then they had to get the guns off the plane so I could get to Vientiane. So somebody came up, next thing I'm, you know, I'm passing out these little arm loads of rifles. Mm -hmm. And somebody drove up in a Jeep, and he, they had this uniform. Mm -hmm. they, they wore uh, brown twill trousers, the biggest jungle boots you have ever seen. They had uh, checkered, uh, strip dry, sports shirts, uh -huh. and they wore wraparound glasses. Anybody who dressed like that, you knew exactly who they were. <laughs> and this guy drives up, 
in the Jeep. Oh, short haircuts. And he takes these glasses off and he looks at me and he puts them back on. He says somebody and they drive off to a building somewhere. And then he drove back later. And by this time we were empty and gun, guns were all off. And I said, when can I get back to the town? And I said, okay, Beery, no problem. I never told anybody my name. <laughs> and I, he, he wanted to know who the hell I was and why I was on this plane and where were all these guns coming from. But this that, is when you were in you were USA. That was by the time, that was you know, like 19... I don't know, 1970 or something, I was coming back from Kuisa. But, but we stayed away from guns. Mm -hmm. uh, by 1967, when I was in Saravan, I went out with the, uh, well, somebody gave the governor uh, a 22. No, I'll take this back. There was one time at Zing Lom where I went out and one of the Thai team next door, uh, there was a bank, maybe, oh, I don't know, 500 feet away from where we live and then he'd go out in this little gully and he'd you know and he was all dressed up in his little uniform and everything and I sat in the bank and had a cigarette and watched this whole thing and finally he said you want to try it and I said sure this is uh, June 26th uh, 1996 uh, we're speaking with uh, Gail and Beery and we're uh, kind of picking off, uh, picking up where we left off yesterday with a, with a, a respond to a question. And a copy of this entire thing is going to be sent to me eventually. Eventually, <laughs> yes, no question. <laughs> okay, you had some questions yesterday about how the, how we felt being in the uh, relationship with AID and IVS and so on. And I was mulling over this last night as I was laying tile and I was thinking about a guy by the name of Arnold Abrams who came and visited the Hmong. And he was a journalist from Hong Kong, uh, wrote for one of the international papers or tribunes, whatever. And he went with me out to the refugee camps and we were sitting there with somebody who had been a refugee eight times and he said, ask him what he thinks about the war. And I thought about this for a second and I said, Arnie, I can't translate that. And he kind of bristled and said, and why not? And I said, well, the sentence wouldn't make any sense in Lao. He says, like what? I said, well, he's in the middle of a situation. You're outside looking at the situation. You're looking at it independently. He's in the middle of a situation, has grown up with it so long. I mean, he's been a refugee for eight, time, eight times, had to move his home. He doesn't think about it in the abstract form. He deals with a concrete, everyday situation. I mean, you want to rephrase the sentence to, has the war been good for your people or bad for your people? Or how has the war affected your normal life? Or what is your normal life? I can do any one of those. But what do you think of the war is just sort of a... I can't do it. And in a way, it was this way with the relationship between IBS and USAID and the war. You didn't look at it in an abstract form unless you traveled physically to stand away and read international journals and get their viewpoint or talk to somebody who just arrived. You simply accepted the fact that, you know, the spooks were down the street in the greenhouse. And Pop Buell was up in northern Laos working with the refugees and then once men IBS. And that some IBSers were doing a really great job and out there in the village and, and digging wells and, uh, you know, dealing in Lao handicrafts for the benefit of the people that made them. And other people were teaching English and some people did nothing at all but sit and, and uh, rap with world uh, travelers that came around. And that was the situation. Some mm -hmm. of you felt was... But, but there were aspects of the situation that you knew you could never get into. And if you probed, things would get complicated. So you just set aside and did the work that, that uh, you were hired to do and uh, didn't look at it as being, uh, what was the word, reluctant counterinsurgency. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a clarification of that. Yes, and, 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 and I think t today, although we're going to talk about lots of other things too, uh, we'll, we'll want to keep clarifying that because uh, I think the way you just put it right now is, is very effective and that's really the way I think about it I mean, personally at this point 
Uh, it's the way I felt about it when I before we even started this because it just that's what reality is. Yeah. Reality isn't you know some kind of neat package as we talked about yesterday. But uh, what I want to do is look into some, especially since we're going to look at this as uh, how do you do this in the future? You know how to do it right or how to do it in a way that's most effective. The, there was there are a couple of issues I thought we'd come back to on on that track. You One mean, of when which you is, say this, you mean. Uh, the relationship setting up between. and operating a any organization at a grassroots level that's right. dealing with another organization which is at a different uh, uh, hierarchy or right. And one of the things we found out by talking is that 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 as opposed to Vietnam, uh, in Laos the entire IVS operation literally got not just its supplies but its direction from USAID. USAID said, "Here, here are your projects." Here's the you know here here's the equipment you need, you know go do it. Mm -hmm. And essentially, IVS was a servant of USAID, and but not a servant in the sense of like a subordinate agency, but rather the nature of that relationship had to be close because of the operational conditions mm -hmm. and the way the actual planning went. You've discussed that sometimes though that that the, the, the friction really between the two groups that, that was uh, significant wasn't these political things which were were very vague that everyone was aware of, but largely stayed away from, but were bureaucratic in the sense of the direction that you said would, would, could give to IBS, very often were programs that were running out of USAID's own bureaucratic needs. Mm -hmm. And IBS then had to say, well, well, wait a minute, we're out here in the villages. This isn't going to work. But they say, well, yes, but remember we were talking about this. Well, yes, well, you've got to do this. A lot of it was yeah. on the, uh, depended on the nature of the individuals involved and how they approach the situation. Mm -hmm. And you meet one kid who just thought military stuff was great, mm -hmm. and they used him as right. a lackey, and he liked it. It was a very uh, mm -hmm. uh, copacetic sort of a situation. Uh, and then you ended up in another situation where uh, an IBSer might be uh, really uh, working with the people and saw it through their viewpoint, and would end up with a superior who uh, trusted him and worked with him, and together they developed the programs. But more often, you ended up with the USAID person at a higher level coming in and saying, no, this is the way it's got to be done, and, and leaving. And you, well, do we reason with this irrational person and try and explain the, the difficulties of working at the grassroots level and the need for getting away from passing out propaganda to, well, that... I don't know of any case where there was propaganda per se. It was you say newspapers or something like that, printed in community development advisors and so on. But the uh, you you had this relationship and how that was in one area might be completely different from down the road. Uh, it was when the IBSer was told that he was part of a big effort fighting communism and that they would do these programs because that's the way they were, uh, that there was a lot of friction. It was when the Ivory Esther went out and found out what the thing was, reported to the, the USAID people in the area, and they had a discussion about it, and hey, let's do this, and let's not do this, and here's a problem, and, and there was a definite support and a nice working relationship. Things worked out real well. Yes, definitely. The question is, did, did the, the, the former ever take place? That is, were, was there occasion where, where, where USAID was telling IBS, this, this program, we want you to do this program because it will have X effect on the political situation in Laos? Not in so many, many well, in some cases, some, you, cases. They, some cases they did say, well, this has to be done because we're supporting the people of Laos in their fight against communism. Mm -hmm. But it usually wasn't as blatant as that. It was just, let's help these poor farmers, and here we've got this great miracle rice that's been grown, and you end up in an argument as to, does miracle rice work or doesn't work, and we can't expect them to stick their necks out and put their mm -hmm. lives on the line for a rice that may or may not work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the thing, what I'm trying to do uh, uh, eventually is uh, find a way of expressing, because I think I mentioned this to you yesterday, find a way of expressing that complexity, because so, uh, other authors have done such a wonderful job of stereotyping the operation in one way or another. And uh, as I mentioned, even talking to Fred, uh, 
Ethan, he sees everything in a very stereotypical way. I and know, that was I his experience. Fred. I don't yeah. think I've talked to him in yeah. 10 years. Yeah. Well, he'd be happy to talk to you. But yeah. uh, but the idea is that, that the problem is somehow we have to become much more subtle than that. And the material that we're trying to find in these interviews is Fred, to Fred get is the to sort of else. person who wandered around town in Bientan. Mm -hmm. He wore black shirt, black pajama pants, really big, ugly, black, earth-type sandal, earth sandals. And you'd be in a restaurant, and he'd come in and sit down with you, and and you'd say, Hi, Fred, how are things going? Well, may I join you? Sure. So he'd join you, and he'd order, uh, you know, steak, a vic, salad, and, and uh, a drink, and then turn and say pleasantly, How long have you been working for the CIA? I mean... This is, you know, out of left field. And and uh, it was kind of hard to deal with somebody who had just such definite opinions. Mm -hmm. And uh, so little productivity, <laughs> as far as we could see, it sort of irritated us. Um, you know, it, it, what, what we're explaining changed at different times and different places. Mm -hmm. Like I went up to, when I was first working for IBS, and, 1962, we began, we were basically clustered in Vientiane, and there was only 16 of us. Mm -hmm. There was the education team, but they operated independently under the education thing, and the chiefs of party got together occasionally, but it was almost like having two teams in two different countries. And uh, it was that way, gee, as long as I remember it. I don't know that there was an all-over chief of party. They basically had two different contracts with AID and operated mm -hmm. almost independently. For, a, for, for education and community and, uh, development? Rural, rural, rural development, development, yeah. Uh, it was known at the beginning uh, as V-A-R-D-A, -A, VARDA, Voluntary Agency Rural Development Activities, was the name of the contract that they signed. So hmm. they, they were Great. known as the IBS slash VARDA right. teams for maybe 1961 and 1962, and by 1963, right. the term had gone out. Mm -hmm. Curiously, we had a guy show up named Keith Vardaman, who just, <laughs> just fit in. Uh, Everyone knew who he worked for. <laughs> he was sort of startled to find his name. Mm -hmm. We also had a man named John Bateau, who's a Lao love, <laughs> because Bateau means, oh, phooey in Lao. Uh -huh. I'll have to write that one down. Um, but I went up to Pon Hong, and it was one of our first teams operating out of, uh, of Vientiane, uh, because we were there, and we began bit by bit to start putting people further out. Mm -hmm. uh, this was under Bob Ziegler, who, uh, when his contract ended, was co-opted and went over and started working for AID, was replaced by... Uh, I can't think of who came first. It was either Walt Howard or uh, Brown. I think he was replaced by uh, Walt Howard, who mm -hmm. was a very, very nice agricultural graduate, a uh, young wife, uh, and he and they, they were, you know, maybe five or six years older than we are, very easy to work with, mm -hmm. and they're very, very easy to get along with, with AID and IBS. And they went home and uh, were replaced by a name, uh, a man by the name of Chester Brown. Mm -hmm. He and his wife were uh, retired uh, dairy persons from Indiana, I think. And they'd never had any children. And I think they got as far as holding the sale of their cattle three times and twice failed to go through with it because they just couldn't sell the cattle and sell the farm. Mm -hmm. The third time they finally did so and came over as chief of party and his wife. And uh, it was a little bit difficult for, for Chet to relate to uh, the youth of IBS in a way that if he'd had children, I think it would have worked out better. Mm -hmm. um, but, but Walt worked with the Lao government and with AID very nicely in, in moving forward and getting programs going and moving people out in the country. And into these teams of two or three or four people who'd go out, and I was stuck with finding the Jeeps and getting the equipment and making sure people were on the manifest and sending somebody out to the airport to pick up the sewing machine that 
the home economist who sent it. But I also kept track of people. Mm -hmm. And I finally ended up taking a piece of plywood about, oh, three feet wide and four feet high. And I put little slots on either side where you could drop cards with names on them. And then I put a map of Laos in the middle and put nails showing where all of the teams were. Mm -hmm. And we were moving people in so fast that you took a card and you put a picture of the person and their name and you drop it on the slot and put a rubber band between the nail here <laughs> and the nail which showed box A, let's say. Uh -huh. and, and every now and then somebody would move and I'd just kind of move the card over to the next slot and uh, Walt would come in and check it over to refresh himself as to who we had where. And he came in one day and he said, you know, I had the weirdest dream last night. I said, what was this? He said, uh, I dreamed I went out in the field and I discovered this complete IBS group out there. There's five or six guys and, and they had this great program going and, you know, they'd been in the country for two years and I didn't know it yet. <laughs> so, so the, we began to move out. Anyway, we went up to Pon Hong and I got kind of intrigued with the, the Pon Hong team because it was only 40 miles or so north of Vientiane. So you move out bit by bit into the progress, into the provinces. And uh, they had a, a concrete block machine, which you mix, it's called a Sinva RAM, C-I-N-V-A hyphen RAM, mm -hmm. and was being sponsored by the Rockefeller Brothers Foundation as a problem of housing in the uh, emerging countries. In 1960, the team that went over with Frank Brainerd and Joe Loomis that went over to Liberia traveled around the country demonstrating this thing in the villages. Mm -hmm. uh, but even the cost of a bag of cement for villagers uh, to build a permanent block was, was uh, a bit too much. And so it, they came back to the States when their time was up and maybe somebody locally used it. Mm -hmm. Well, we had one of these and the thing to show the Lao how it works was to build blocks. And so one of the guys up there was building blocks and he was enclosing the ground floor of this old Lao house. And it was, it was really kind of rough uh, summer camp type living <laughs> situation. We built bunks in and, and had a kind of a sloppy kitchen down there with kerosene stoves. I think finally everybody switched back to wood because it made a lot more sense than importing kerosene. But we would drive out in the villages and meet people and do things one of the projects that the team sort of independently decided upon was to build squat toilets. And we built a little frame about three feet wide and four inches deep and molded a form of clay in the shape of a neck like this and we put about two inches of cement on it and strengthened it with wire or something. And villagers would drop by and see how things were going because these things cost two or three dollars if you went to Vien Chan and bought them. And if you could build them yourself, you'd save a lot of money. <laughs> so I left them and we had this thing, uh, you know, what a squat toilet looks like upside, sitting there drying. We had just received uh, radios because communications was difficult. Eventually, it was all taken over completely by AID, mm -hmm. and they were just in charge of giving us radios and making sure we had them, or, or we set up uh, some accommodation with whoever was around that we could use their radio and, mm -hmm. and talk to Vientiane. Um, when I was in Sarabon, 1967, Operation Brotherhood already had their radio set up and everything, so I never got one. I just would go down and, and use theirs as actually I was over them in a nice polite way. Right. And what was, was Operation Brotherhood? Operation Brotherhood was this uh, junior chamber of commerce from the Philippines kind of funded right. it. And they sent doctors and nurses out and they had a hospital running down the Cerebon. Mm -hmm. And so they had radio and equipment and an operating room and some pretty relaxed doctors and nurses. And it was kind of an interesting situation. But mm -hmm. I'd go over and use the radio. But in Pon Hong, we had this generator and we had this old... Um, uh, radio that had to turn on and switch around with channels and we ran up a jury type uh, uh, radio tower. Um, we also, 
and th and that's how we communicate. At six o'clock, you turn everything on and call Vian Chan and, and figure out what's going on and get things sorted out. Um, there had been some things ordered in 1959 or 60, which finally arrived in 60, uh, no, 61, I guess they were ordered, and they arrived in 62 when I was there. These were, I only saw them once. There were boxes that were maybe five feet square and about 12 feet long, and there were three or four of these, and these contained these triangular masks that you put up. Uh, for radio transmission. You know, you've got three bars mm -hmm. and one cross bars going up and you hook them together. And I was under the concept that this would be, we'd be, be putting one of these out at each IBS station, but the boys next door and USAID got together mm -hmm. and all of these kind of merged into the USAID operations, even though they were uh, ordered to work with the IBS. And it was decided then that that USAM would take care of the radio transmissions of 24-hour operators and, mm -hmm. and the whole bit. They would get the radios, do the repairs, uh, have the frequencies and the whole thing. And, and communication is a rather important thing when you mm -hmm. think about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, the reason I got into this was because I went back to Vientiane and we had the radio and, and the, the IBSers were properly appreciative of the rules and restrictions because there was a lot of radio traffic and you had to keep your things to a minimum. When I left, I uh, said, well, call me up on the radio and tell me how this thing turns out. I want to see how this uh, this particular little squat toilet uh, mm -hmm, right. comes out when you take the clay off. Uh -huh. And they said, well, we want to kind of restrict, you know, just traffic on the radio. I said, well, just Call it Sylvester and tell me how Sylvester's doing along, <laughs> getting along. About a week later, uh, Walt walks in and he's scratching his head and he's got this radio message. And he says, Galen, do you know anybody named Sylvester? And I said, no, I don't think. So well, we got this straight, strange message from Pon Hong and it says, attention to you. And it says, Sylvester's neck is broken. <laughs> Oh, how do you spell Pon Hong, by the way? Pon Hong, P-H-O-N-E-H-O-N-G. Right. That's about 40 miles. It's a, you know, it, from what I understand from June and others, the 40-mile stretch from Vientiane up to that is now pretty much solid village on either side of the road now. I, yeah. I was amazed. They drove up and they said, you couldn't believe it. Homes on either side, people walking across, markets about every half mile, uh, radio uh, and TV uh, antenna all over the place. Mm -hmm. said, you just can't believe the growth in population plus the fact that so many refugees moved in there and settled. And people are moving out of the cities, buying land, building their houses. It's part of the new economic uh, mm -hmm. uh, growth that's going on there. The same thing as in Vietnam. It's, yeah. it's just startling. But of course, you know, the, the tradition of the road being the yeah. center part is, is pretty, even goes back to medieval Europe. Well, you did you did get used to this stuff uh, of the of the radio thing, but the isolation. I mean, I was at Saravan, which is a provincial capital. Mm -hmm. uh, this is 1967, with I was with AID, mm -hmm. and uh, I one day went over and kept calling Vientiane. I had to call somebody about some medical supplies that were coming in for the dispensaries or something, and I could just never get through. And finally, the operator answered and he said, yes, Mr. Berry, how can I help you? And I said, how did you know who I was? I never used my name. And he said, uh, you're the only person in the country who says, have you any message for me? <laughs> have you? Instead of, you got any message? You got any message? Something like that. Uh -huh. College education. So I office. said, uh, well, hey, I've been trying to raise all these people what's the matter? He said, well, today's Thanksgiving Day. Everybody take the day off. Oh, <laughs> okay, well, we'll figure this out. I'll call them up. And I went back and systems, there were about three or four systems, all loud, said, well, I said, well, uh, we made a mistake. Oh, dear, what's the mistake? I said, we worked all day and it's a vacation day. <laughs> well, what's vacation? I mean, it's a, it's a holiday, Thanksgiving. So I explained the concept of Thanksgiving and said, we're apparently the only people in the country that is still working uh, for IBS and uh, for AID. 
well, what will we do? I said, well, we'll just pick a day next week when we're not doing, when, you know, we want to take the day, we'll take the whole day off. And the next uh, week I called out and said, we're taking the day off because we forgot Thanksgiving and everybody was happy. That's amazing. The, um, uh, one of the things we talked about yesterday was uh, the guns, which is a great story. Yeah. And the reasons for not arming. Uh, uh, who was it? Uh, was it Gary Studebaker? You seen? There were two Studebakers. Yeah, there two one Stud- was in Vietnam, and he was the brother of Gary who ended up in Laos. Right, but the one who was in, in Vietnam was killed. Yes. He and married so, right. a Vietnamese girl. They'd been married about three months or so, and uh, the house where they lived was attacked by armed people. I guess he shot to death at that time. Mm-hmm. I'd have to look up the mm-hmm. exact story. And uh, but Gary, uh, there was there was some trouble in his district, so to speak, mm. and uh, he was issued, uh, you know, a rifle. They were all given rifles, mm. and uh, something we didn't talk about. We, we talked about the practical Gary, implication. Down here in Compton, right? Yeah, uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Okay. D- Downey in Downey. Downey. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, there's a very funny story there, by the way. It's, is this Gary? Yes, it's Gary. That uh, when we sent out these forms to to be given out. His form came back, and the yes had been circled. Yes, I'd like to be interviewed. But then it was whited out, and the no was circled. But because of one reason or another, I think the way we Xerox the forms, mm. the form I got, it looked like it was circled yes. Okay. So I called Gary up. I actually talked to his wife, and uh, and uh, we had a very nice conversation. She said, well, I'm sure he'd be happy to talk to you. Why don't you, you know, here's our, you know, and we set it all up, and uh, talked to Gary on the phone, and then I went down there, and in talking to them, it turned out, his wife had whited out his yes ah. because she thought, you know, he doesn't need to go over all of this, you know, again and stuff like that. And, and sounds like her. And was very happy that it turned out the way it did. We had a great, a great time. He's only the second person I interviewed. So, um, mm. but it was great. But that re- that raised an issue that I thought we might as well we might as well address anyway. We'll probably have to do it for. Uh, and and uh, about the, one of the first things that I did after I decided to do this IBS project. It was at a conference at Notre Dame on, on, the, on Vietnam, and uh, I saw John Balaban, who was mm-hmm. in Vietnam with IBS. And he has this big thing in Remembering Heaven's Face where he was given a, a weapon to defend a hospital. He said, you know, anyone comes up the street, you know, you have to shoot them because otherwise all these mm-hmm. patients will yeah. be killed. And uh, he had to, you know, deal with that. It was just something he had to deal with. And... A lot of the IVS personnel, or virtually all of the IVS personnel, well, not virtually all, that's not fair, a large proportion of IVS personnel were conscientious objectors. Mm-hmm. And I wondered how, how did they address this fact that they might have to carry weapons for self-protection? Or well, avoid I was it. one, and you heard the story. Yes, you that. avoided it. That's what well, I was to give you an example, uh-huh. we were up in Phong Hong. I, I think one of the guys had a, a rifle he bought from somebody for five bucks. Mm-hmm. And, and they would go out and go hunting, right? You know, but that was about it. I, I, there was guns all over the place. Um, at Phong Hong, I do remember one time we got some uses films, and here's another tie-in. You mm-hmm. you go to the village celebrations, and they had a festival going on about two miles away, and asked if we could possibly get some uses films and so on. So we went down, and the uses. Fellow, they they had uh, U.S. Information Service had these guys that they taught how to run and repair movie projectors, and they gave them a jeep, and they went out and put posters up in villages and showed up at, at the the festivals, the boons. Well, we walked over rice paddies, these little narrow dikes, to the village for about a mile and a half, two miles or so. And we could hear the music even as we approached, <laughs> pitch black. You had somebody in front and you had somebody in back and traded carrying the uh, movie projector and somebody else had a bag with the films and, and, and so on. And there was about eight or nine of us in a row, including two or three soldiers who went along to make sure all things were okay. Now we were not worried because Pon Hong was the sort of place where you had a festival. And they told me, one of, one of the chaps had been at the festival and he said it was, it was really weird. He said, Kong Lei soldiers were there, and the Royal Ar- Lao Army soldiers were there, and everybody put down their guns at the end of the village and came in and danced with the local girls, and they walked out both ends of the village the other direction, mm-hmm. um, and it worked out very well. The 
I think he did worry about was weapons uh, to the point where I think there was one drunk, drunk soldier and the girl refused to let him dance. So he staggered over to the dance floor and tossed out a hand grenade and I think she lost part of the leg. Uh, that was one of the incidents that did happen. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, soldiers, guns, uh, weapons, and uh, being drunk. Uh, but I'm not even sure what side the soldier was on. Mm -hmm. um, probably the Royal Lao Army because nobody identified him as being Patet Lao or, or mm -hmm. Kong Lei type. Anyway, I'm going across the rice paddy and carrying the stuff and something hit me in the chest and I finally reach up and it's the the barrel of the M16 of the soldier in front of me. And I said, stop. And he said, stop. I said, you will carry this gun pointing that way. You know? <laughs> and hey, guys, check to make sure everybody got their gun pointing somewhere other than your chest. And then we went on and went to the village. But that's how close we were to this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And it was not unusual when you'd be in a village and you'd be sitting there talking to the Tashang or the Chao Mung, and you'd say, can we go out to this village? And we intend to check the uh, schools being built and so on. Uh, yeah, and he'd call over somebody and they'd talk for a couple of minutes. They'd say, sure, there haven't been any, been anybody sighted there for about six weeks. I think you're okay. Or sometimes he'd look thoughtful and he'd say, well, I wouldn't go to that one. The next one's okay, but I, I would like to send two or three soldiers along with you. And in isolated cases, you did end up in a jeep going somewhere and you had a couple soldiers sitting in the back. It wasn't the norm, though. <laughs> now, the, the thing that got a lot of people polarized in IBS as to being either fight the good fight or let's move out or let's keep working but under conditions uh, was the growth of guerrilla activity and fighting and problems and so on. We had the, the height of it. Uh, came with uh, the death of Art Stillman, mm -hmm. who, I mean, that pretty much brought it to a head in Laos, mm -hmm. where the the team, I mean, we had a man drowned mm -hmm. in uh, 1963, uh, which to me was particularly um, poignant because I could remember sitting with him um, six months earlier in the ACA and we were talking mm -hmm. and he mentioned that he liked where he was except you had to form toward this stream to mm -hmm. get to the IBS thing and it was the water was about three feet deep and he could not swim and I was intrigued by an American boy who could not swim uh, turned out that he was from Rockville Maryland but he never learned to swim and uh, six months later he was fording the stream and his rubber sandal came off and bobbed to the surface and he reached over to get it and lost his uh, step or his footing on the gravel they had on the bottom of the fort and went under and came up three days later and we Our, our 30 minutes aside, so yours is oh, probably okay. 45, oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so they came up with a, a very nice locally made coffin. It was the old French style. It was sort of, uh, you, you know, it was wide in the shoulders and mm -hmm. tapered and mm -hmm. had a cross on the top. And it was lined with uh, zinc or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, his body was placed in that and taken to the airport and flew to the United States. And later on, uh, Chester Brown was, there was some sort of a ceremony where they were awarding medals and uh, I had to go down and had a black velvet cushion made. I just explained that, hey, I want this material, make a cushion about this big and about this thick. It's for the awarding of the design. The, the local tailor whipped it up and I gave it to Chet and he went out and held this and His Majesty the King came along and uh, an aid uh, placed on the black cushion, a uh, uh, the award of the million elephants, mm -hmm. and this was for the IBSer who had, who had drowned, and I had to take all of his things and and package them up and, and send them back, which was kind of interesting because his diary was in it and I read it, and I was in the diary, mm -hmm. 
you know, and he was he was a very Christian, very conscientious sort that that always said the rosary in the morning and the evening, and and he he did make some interesting comments about the the world as he expected it mm -hmm. to be, and that that he was amazed at the way people accepted what could be done and what couldn't be done and went along with cases, even Galen Butch, and then he gave an instance or two, which I don't remember. And uh, I always thought that, and I always kind of wished that I'd made a little copy of it, but I felt a little guilty for reading it anyway. Mm -hmm. But uh, he would start out with the prayers for so-and-so, just write them in his little diary. So anyway, I sent all that back. Uh, that wasn't death. Now later on the death started to, or the incidents started mm -hmm. to increase. We had one particularly jovial guy. He was Jewish. He was from New York. He you, had you wouldn't hair. believe that it says Jewish. Uh, Jews in Laos was one of the questions okay. I was going to ask you. Like, yeah, Chaim Levitt, uh -huh. C H A I M L E A V I T T. Uh -huh. okay. And Chaim Levitt had this huge nose and curly hair. He was the stereotype, and he was a terrific guy. <laughs> I've got a picture of him out here, somewhere, mm -hmm. holding a rifle. And he and some of the guys had gone hunting, or maybe somebody had gone hunting, <clears throat> but they shot a wild pig. And here he was, kind of. <laughs> well, there's, the there, goes, there goes his Jewish with show a stature. big smile on his face. <laughs> yes. And Kaim Levitt and another guy ended up in. Uh, well, they were a pair. They they just you know were roommates the entire time they were in Laos. And they were in a house somewhere when bullets started going through one side of the building and out the other. Uh, we left that particular site the same night and never went back to it. Mm -hmm. I don't even remember where it was. It was in central Laos somewhere. Uh, could have been the Sayabui province or north of Yantan somewhere. but. Anyway, they moved to another site. I, 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 think, I think the first site they were at, there was something happened and they had to leave because of patrols in the area and there was a firefight down the street or something. Mm -hmm. And the second time they were somewhere and uh, it could have been Takek in that area. I again have to read. But I think that there had been some shooting and they came around the corner and found bodies here and there on the road, which was kind of hard to take. And so there was a lot of evaluation as to whether they wanted to stay there and this would change. And they moved to a third site and this is the place where the bullets started going mm -hmm. through the wall. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was quite an epic, uh, you know, I mean, they did a lot of evaluation <laughs> of life and their role in it and everything. Mm -hmm. But uh, Kaim didn't worry about it because he had about, uh, Oh, I guess two or three months left. And he did, you know, worked here or there, just little miscellaneous, fi finishing up for other people's projects. Mm -hmm. And uh, then left the country. He did not go back to the United States. He flew via South Asia to Israel. Mm -hmm. And one of the guys got a letter from him a couple months later. <laughs> uh, apparently. <laughs> He arrived about one week before the six-day war broke out, and he ended up as a uh, riding in a jeep with a machine gun. <laughs> you know, he had some rather tongue-in-cheek, pungent remarks about the entire situation. Where, and we, we, you know, we used to joke, joke uh, jest about the kind of level wherever he went, where he went, the war started, and finally he went where it was safe in Tel Aviv, and there the six-day war erupted. It's one of these jinxes sort of things. Mm -hmm. um, you ask about Jews in, in uh, yeah. Laos. There was uh, one chap who was a um, area coordinator. He worked with AID, Agency for International Development. Actually, it was, uh, oh, I guess, Howie and Klein and uh, this chap. His name was Diffendurfer. Mm -hmm. And he and his wife were very nice people, and he was just so much out of his element as the area coordinator in Pakse in southern Laos. And uh, they had a a child, I don't remember if it was a boy or girl, I don't remember, it was probably a boy, and he was probably uh, seven or eight. And uh, 
the local Protestant missionaries were having a big Christmas celebration, and Devin Durfer was saying, eh, it was hard for his wife. She had to sit down and <laughs> explain to their son why he couldn't go to this Christmas celebration, because all the other kids were going, and he was supposed to be a shepherd in the chorus and so on. And Differ Differ was, um, that's the only aspect of that I know about. Mm -hmm. Personally, he was one of the most out of place people in the, in the country that I knew of. He, uh, he had no idea of what we were doing, and yet he was my boss. Mm -hmm. And the Lao officials I was dealing with knew this, mm -hmm. and they also knew that he was a jerk. And he used to go around with wearing uh, Bermuda shorts, no, cut off. Well, they weren't cut offs, they were short shorts, you know. Mm -hmm. And he had this big rose garden that he took care of. And I had to approach him very carefully and explain what he should do in a nice way so that he would do it, you know. Uh, we ended up in a situation once where a Lao general showed up at his house because he was so concerned about the status of something going on, and he could speak fairly good broken English. And Diffenderfer listened to everything he had to say and then took him on a tour of the Rose Garden, and it drove this general up the wall that the American, he was trying to explain, you you know, sit down on a man-to-man -man basis and get things solved. And I uh, heard about this, and I said, he did what? Oh, well, he came to my house. He was so nice, and he, well, he talked. Uh, well, he, it was hard. He was telling about this. But I, anyway, I gave him a very good tour of the Rose Garden, and I said, you know, I really, I really think you ought to sit down and talk with the people in Vientiane, and, and let's get some work done, and go and personally look him up and say, uh, you know, you were disconcerted to hear this, could only show him the Rose Garden, but let's work out some solutions to this, because he's, he's probably gone off the deep end right now, because he... For him to come to you was a great honor in it. Okay. Uh, he also, and this was a relation with the aid officials, sometimes he didn't know what they were doing. You, you showed him that they did like this, mm -hmm. you know, when you greet each other. So Diffenderfer would go into a room, hey, hello everybody, how are you doing, you know? And everybody would look at him like he was crazy. So having seen this once or twice, I, I said, boy, you can tell that little old man from the village. And he said, what? And I said, well, I, that little old man, he really doesn't know the, he, he's, he's Lao, but he doesn't know his own uh, traditions, and everybody thinks he's a little bit crazy, because he comes in and he goes like this and this, when he should just go like this. Oh, so that, that was the way of you're showing him the right way of and, and, what, what in India would be called making namaste. Yeah. See, putting your hands together. And, and, and this is what's called a Y in Lao, mm -hmm. and this is what... Uh, Diffenderfer did it the right way after that, mm -hmm. but I could never quite bring myself. No, I think you found uh, the absolute appropriate. You had, to, you had to work with a lot of people rather obliquely. Mm -hmm. uh, the the epic time came when one of the governors was with Diffenderfer, and I was there. Uh, he called me in as an interpreter because I spoke loud, and. The governor would ask a question Lao, and I'd tell Diffenderfer, and he'd search for an answer and give me an answer in English, and, and I'd tell the governor, and the governor know a bit of, of English. And I would pass on a straight question and get a straight answer and get something that didn't make sense at times, and finally the governor looked at me and said, I don't know what the hell he's talking about. Or no, no, it started out the governor... The, the conversation was going along, and then Diffenderfer said, Oh, Galen, I, I guess I'll have to pretend. Monsieur le Governor, uh, avec le problème, and he started going on on this French he was trying to learn. And it was, it was like he was reading it from a textbook when all the accents were wrong. And I never studied French. I just, you know, learn a word here and there, or meet a French girl and talk, and, you know. And... So he explained this all in French. And the governor turned to me, he looked very thoughtful. He looked at me and he said in Lao, I don't know what the hell he's talking about, do you? And I said very politely in Lao, I believe he was trying to speak French to you. I myself do not speak French, but what he was trying to say was, 
And I explained my translation of his French to the governor. And, and you just sort of dealt with it. That particular conversation, though, went, went on so fast that at one time the Lao was speaking, the, the Lao was speaking English, Diffenderfer was speaking Lao, and I was speaking French. I mean, we, you know, hey, going along in a conversation, and I suddenly realized that was what the last 30 seconds had been, is each one of us was using a, a language that was alien to what we normally spoke, and then suddenly we were back into the regular English Lao uh, bit. Uh, what were the, what was the, uh, I mean, I, I ha ha happen to, don't, don't believe that the, I, I, this is not the right way of approaching it, but the idea, the role of women in IBS in, in, in Laos. Do you have any stories or... or uh, well, I'll turn off everything. I've got to go ahead. Yeah, yeah. That's a, this is a good time. In fact, I was going to suggest that. Yeah. And let's get that started. Uh, anyway, about the women in IBS. Were there many women in the early years? Yes. The, um, one of them just died here at Hillcrest recently. No, who was that? Um, let me think for a while. Okay. She got, she got married since she was an IBS. Now I think of her IBS name, and I have to remember the last name, and I can't remember the IBS one now. Mm -hmm. uh, back in 19, the, the original concept was that IBS would field teams of young Americans with college degrees and or uh, demonstrated expertise in their fields. Mm -hmm. uh, you might have a young college graduate from Kansas with a degree in livestock or poultry husbandry or or at the same time you might have somebody who didn't have a college degree but who'd run a uh, a tractor and uh, what would you call it a, a small engine repair shop for three years but he only had two years of college i mean somebody like that would be great if you ended up in a in a thing where you were having a uh, machinery repair type uh, class at a, the National Education Center in Laos, for example. Demonstrated expertise and or a degree or both. And the original concept was that on these teams, and this was shown in India because they had some uh, public health nurses who did a fantastic job of training local indigenous nurses, and the concept, uh, and also in, in Iraq you had nurses, and it carried over into Laos where Nurses and home economists were um, an integral part of the entire program. Uh, we had one girl who was, I believe she was Canadian even, uh, Brenda Gorman, who in 1965 and 66 uh, was in Laos and was uh, teaching the home economists. Um, and we, there was another gal who was out in the field who had the local public health nurses at the Takak Hospital, and she was more or less the chief nurse, and trained the nurses. Usually you ended up with the women in group situations, uh, training them how to cook better food, how to use uh, bulgur wheat, how to improve the taste of the local varieties of rice, how to how to bake, you know, little things like this. You, but the the public health nurses were much more in a situation where they were in hospital roles, working with local technicians, but getting a lot of USA commodities, mm -hmm. uh, medical types. I know that Brenda did, uh, well, when we had the great flood in 1966 in Vientiane, she mm -hmm. went around and helped set up, what would you call them, first aid centers and the great fear was for cholera and they got some vaccine somewhere and started inoculating everybody and she was showing IBSers how to do it and my friend Jack up in Canada I've got a picture of him and her I was riding around the motor scooter taking pictures of everybody else doing everything mm -hmm. and so she was training the IBSers how to give the shots to protect people from cholera and what have you out there. Mm -hmm. uh, they were pretty well accepted. I usually uh, administering the housing of the IBS teams in Vientiane, which was temporary, you know, and they, they got their housing and did their clothing and everything out in the field. But in Vientiane, I had the housing and uh, hired a lady to do the washing and, and they paid this lady on a 
piecework basis until it got to be a mess. And then I charged everybody a dollar a night and then they got free laundry done. Mm -hmm. Although I did have some discussion with people that brought in three weeks of dirty laundry from the field and expected her to do it all at once. So in each one of these situations, yeah, we'll just let's, uh, in each one of these housing situations, there was a usually, I guess it was just kind of automatic that there was kind of a, uh, a girl who was in charge of everything. How does this thing work? I think you just stick your thumb in. Mm -hmm. What do we do? Turn it over? Mm -hmm. Side two? Yours is still good. Mine got no, two. No, mine's fine. Yours has got two lights and mine's got yeah. one. There you go. Mine's got <laughs> we don't want to put them too close, otherwise oh, okay. it picks up the tape. Okay. Yeah. Um, in each one of these situations, there was usually one gal who was more mature than the rest, who was based in Vientiane and became kind of the administrator with regard to women's situations. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we discuss any problems that I was having <clears throat> with maybe, maybe a girl was, uh, living, I, I had very few of these, but maybe you'd have a girl who came to, uh, visit, uh, Vien Chan and there was something happened and I was, I was aware of something that was happening and I'd go to the gal and I'd say we got a problem here and she'd check it out and take care of the, the thing that, that you and I couldn't do because we just like the physical. Mm -hmm. um, occasionally I uh, gave her a situation that was easier for her to work with. For example, the maid came to me and she said, that one girl in room such and such, the sheets were all bloody. Oh, fine. And I'd go to Brenda, solve this problem for us, you know, and, and things were taken care of. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were accepted uh, as, you know, just other IVSers. Mm -hmm. It's just that they had their own uh, world. Um, some of them uh, dated anybody but IVSers. And you were never quite sure. You had uh, gals who would be dating pilots and uh, USAID personnel. But they just, you know, they weren't interested in IVSs. But, you know, that was all outside the work thing, and it didn't, didn't affect anything as far as mm -hmm. I know. Uh, there, were, uh, there were women in cluster village teams yeah. also? Mm -hmm. yeah. I seem to remember a couple of them. Uh, there was, I believe, that, that there was at least one case where uh, somebody became pregnant, and it was handled very quietly and discreetly, and the child was, I believe she left IBS early and had the child and it was adopted by a local family. I know very little about it. A local I family think, in the States? Uh, I think it was an American family in Laos. In Laos. Mm -hmm. hmm. I know another gal who was really funny. She was Chinese American and uh, she had an interpreter and they were both jolly sorts. and. Uh, I don't know, She, I guess she was a home economist or a nurse working in the villages and she had an interpreter and one thing led to another and hey, let's get married and occasionally you did have marriages with local people. I've got some really gorgeous pictures that Jack took at a bossy of a, uh, one chap and, and the girl he married in a village mm -hmm. and uh, oh, IVS pretty well went along with it providing it didn't provide any real complications in carrying out the normal operation. I mean, what can you do? Mm. Anyway, she married this guy, and uh, I believe two months later, uh, his sister died, and his sister had a small baby. And the husband was in the military or something, and not knowing what to do, he adopted his sister's baby. And the reason I remember it in this, because she was telling me about it, she said, hey, he was in the bathroom, he was shaving one morning, he was laughing and laughing, and I walked in and said, what's going on? He was standing there looking in the mirror and he was saying, look, I was this K carefree young bachelor until three months ago, and now I'm married, and I even have that baby. And uh, some of them, I guess, worked out, and some of them didn't, you know, on the, on the marriages. Mm -hmm. But they did have a definite role, and 
work in the situations as necessary. They did not go in it. I don't know of any on forward area teams. And they tended to be more in the capital and provincial centers. Mm -hmm. The National Education Center, I think half their team was uh, women teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, but home economists and nurses uh, are kind of hard to find, and they were working with counterparts in the Royal Lao government, mm -hmm. uh, the Ministry of uh, Education, Ministry of, uh, it wouldn't be home economics, but there was some sort of a ministry in there, and they, they trained nurses and, and uh, got cooking schools and things going, nutrition particularly. Mm -hmm. um, is, is it, um, did you ever meet David Dukes, or you know the yes I, his, his, I met David you Duke. must have met him and known him actually this was really approximately well. 1960 must have been about 66 mm -hmm. and David Duke was over there he was I think 15 or 16 years old I don't, I'm pretty sure he wasn't much older than that mm -hmm. and uh, maybe 17 and he was quite intent a very intelligent person but he had really warped ideas I met him, I believe, twice, and one time we sat, and I first, it was just casual, he came up and referred to me as name, and I asked who he was, and he introduced himself, and we talked for a couple of minutes, and he trundled off, and uh, because by this time, I was sort of a, a fixture in the landscape, and a lot of people knew me. They came and got, went, and I was just sort of there, mm -hmm. and he asked some questions about Lao. We got together the next time, and he began to explain to me that uh, his father worked for Aid or Air America or something, and he had, I gather, something of a uh, checkered pattern in his family relationships. I don't remember what it was. It was not typical. It, his father may have met a strong militarist or something of the sort. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember anything about his mother. And it could be that his father and mother were divorced and he was living with his father and going to the American school. And anyway, he started going on uh, telling about the class that he had out at the National or at the uh, Army Center. And his job was to teach English to the Lao Army officers. And then he started telling me what he was teaching them. And it was words like nigger, and then he, and he started going on and on until, it, you know, he thought the Nazi army was just absolutely great and uh, got into race relations. And, uh, you know, I listened somewhat stunned for about 20 or 30 minutes and, and tried to figure out what in the world this guy was doing. How could anybody hire him to be teaching Lao army officers and trying to figure out who I should talk to about this? And I think I did call somebody in charge of the school and say I was definitely concerned about this one person and they thanked me politely uh, that they had other reports and something of this sort. Mm -hmm. And there was one 15-year-old girl. He may have been 17 or 18 by then. Mm -hmm. There was one 15-year-old girl who was, you look around and they, they take over a group. And this gal was not the most attractive, and she wasn't the oldest, but there was something about her that the teenagers revered her. And a lot of them were just stupid, ungainly, junk food eaters that wanted nothing to do but eat, swim, and party. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have sat out by the USAID swimming pool and watched three or four kids get in this huge altercation, and they say, Oh, let's go to so-and-so. She'll know what to do. And they'd come over and they would talk to her and she would ask two or three polite questions and she would observe this and observe that and get everything settled and they would move off and she'd go back to reading her magazine or whatever. Just, mm -hmm. uh, just one of these natural leaders that everybody respected. And I went over to her and I said, I run into this chap by the name of David Duke. Can I explain my conversation and some of my concerns and she'd say I gotta admit those of us in high school we don't know quite what to do with him either and that's the first and last time I ever ran into him. <laughs>
Uh, you know, we started t talking about uh, Art Stillman. Has there. anybody else mentioned him or what? Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, uh, Howard, uh, I think. Yeah. Uh, Howard Lewin, uh, I think, mentioned that, uh, that uh, but not that he'd met him directly, that he mm -hmm. more uh, heard of him or something like that. But uh, everyone, actually people who know about his career, know that he was in Laos and all of that. I don't think they know. Uh, you may just have placed on record the only actual first person account mm -hmm of meeting and talking with him and knowing what he was actually... I've met a lot of interesting was. people. You may have read it in yeah. the paper several years ago, but I, this is here, neither here nor there, but I went out on uh, what, 7th Street here, and there's this rather beautiful house that we have, and I drove up in my car one day, and the guy was had these uh, oh, Bombador-type glasses and kind of standing there with his arms folded and a couple people picking up leaves on the lawn, and... and uh, I said, hi, you live here? Yes, we live here now. And I said, well, this is a very nice house. It's a price house built in 1918 at the end of World War I. And I went on to describe the house and so on. And they've been rented. Yeah, we've rented. He, he, did, he was kind of noncommittal. The, uh, you know, and I identified myself as being with the Historical Society and gave him a card. And I, I did notice the two people kind of look our direction and scuttle into the house. And so we... He didn't say too much. Anyway, after three or four minutes, I left. And that's how I met David Koresh. Really? Yeah. Because they had the house here, and they moved from here to uh, uh, Waco. And uh, after the Waco burning, I was sitting here at 4 o'clock, and then comes my local restaurant down here and my local waitress and the whole thing. Oh, my goodness. That, that is something people thought they they, they, they felt uh, uh, a special treat when they met John Steinbeck in Vietnam, something like that. Well, his son showed up in Laos. Uh, yeah, uh huh. Well, yeah. he would he was a newsman, I think. Uh, John. He wrote some stuff, uh -huh. but he was living on his father's reputation. Right. Mm -hmm. There was, uh, and this was one of the disillusionments mm -hmm. we had with some of the IVSers in in that period, the sixty seven, sixty eight, sixty nine, because uh -huh. the the Aid was pretty straight, and John Steinbeck shows up and is rented a house. And I went out one day, and and there were half a dozen people wandering around zombies, just toked up on marijuana or something else. And there were some of the IVSers who were just quite excited about, you know, this is so and so. Was his name John also? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, that they had met John Steinbeck. Well, I didn't know which one he was. They all looked plastered to me, and. Uh, you know, I left home. But the IBS just thought this was really wonderful. And then also we had the uh, Sean Flynn. Uh -huh. I was back, that was the next yeah. thing I was going to ask you. Yeah. Yeah. And after he disappeared into Cambodia and was never found, just a motorcycle and nothing else, mm -hmm. uh, and there was some IBS girl or maybe an international traveler just tears in her eyes that he was just so wonderful and this and it was such a great tragedy and my my attitude was you know the guy's an ass he everybody says don't go and he goes and there's soldiers with guns just like they told him and he disappears mm -hmm. he got into it by himself mm -hmm. maybe he didn't deserve it but it was his fault Oh, but he was just so handsome, and, and you begin to realize that either you were getting older, or people were drifting into this uh, the '60s thing, which never really reached us too much. Mm -hmm. I was, mean, we, you, this is a place where you could go down the market and buy marijuana by the kilo. Yes, uh -huh. I knew that things were getting bad when the little old man came up to me, and he had this little plastic package he'd made, and he had twenty hand rolled mm -hmm. inside. Mm -hmm. Somebody, Tom, Kanyaksu joint, blah, and he used the word joint, mm -hmm. you know, and I knew, hey, everything's going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, was, was, but did Flynn spend much time in Laos? Uh, maybe six weeks. Mm -hmm. I, I, maybe that was Steinbeck, but I no, didn't see him or rap with him or anything. Mm -hmm. I may have seen Steinbeck, but... There were about six people in that house. Yeah, that's funny. There's a, uh, there's a actually a, someone I know has written a book about his experiences in in, in Cambodia. Or I knew him after he wrote, he wrote the stories. It, it was called The Mark, 
by his name was Jacques Leslie. I've Is that been printed? Uh huh. Yeah. So it's, it came out last year. Yeah. And uh, but the the thing about the the Cambodian. The, the problem was that since everyone was kind of like stuck in the capital, hmm. when you heard of an operation somewhere up Fine, we've only got about five minutes left here, and uh, I'm using uh, one of uh, Galen's own tapes. Uh, and I thought that would be in, in his honor, and we'll, uh, and, and we'll see. But uh, uh, let's see, what were we talking about? <laughs> we were doing so well at that moment. Oh, yes, that IBS uh, started out uh, trying to fulfill... Uh, the four-point program with with the, the uh, youth element of it, and uh, but it, originally it was uh, before the youth program. It was sending professionals into the field from the United States, largely people with degrees yeah. mm -hmm. in those particular areas. As it developed the uh, as it developed the the youth program, eventually people like Val Peterson ended up being sent out. These were there generalists. Were, there were yeah. generalists who were volunteers who mm -hmm. wanted to uh, do something in Southeast Asia. Uh, then. Uh, when did when were the when were all the aid contracts terminated? What year was that? You know, I, know, I lost you, track. Yeah, yeah uh, we'll, 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 we'll I have was probably up to my knees and refugees. After yes, a while. that's something we'll probably Don will probably tell us. It's no problem. That's why you have a main office. Well, you <laughs> have a first of all the concept was how do we get this thing going? Starting about 1954, right. and from then until 1961, the concept was you recruit a team headed by a chief of party. Uh, under that, you have technicians who have a degree and or expertise in hard fields such as agriculture, health, community, uh, well, community development's a little more questionable, mm -hmm. more sociological. Uh, livestock, uh, farm equipment, animal poultry, animal husbandry, and so on. But as you started going into the 60s, we were now getting the latter half of the 20th century. People were not graduating with those degrees anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, we're getting people with degrees in Peruvian finger painting and things like this. I mean, it was completely, they were generalists. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Val was the first non, and I was the second. And then later on, it got to like 1967, you'd look, what's he got a degree in? Fine arts. Uh, what's he got a degree in? And it would be something totally irrelevant, but they were interested in this, and the idea was they could go out and start working with the villages at the local level. Mm -hmm. um, they did get away from teacher recruiting, except for the education team in Laos. That basically went by default to the Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. and, and then, between 1975, with all the teams leaving, of course you had Cambodia, but that was an uh, aberration. Mm -hmm. Uh, all of the teams, one thing you talked to June about, she started out in Vietnam with mm -hmm. IBS, served in Cambodia with IBS, mm -hmm. and ended up in Laos with IBS. So probably one of the only, only people. Yes. ever did three countries. Uh -huh. And then you have this graduation where you say, then the next big step is the ending of USAID contracts and searching for individualized specialty things under USAID. And finally, it's using what contribution comes in you, you don't have enough money to hire Americans, so you started hiring people who were non-American to work in their own country, which is uh, not the original concept of IDS. No. And I, in a way, I don't really relate to reading all of these uh -huh. people with odd names who are telling about what it's like to help somebody raise better chickens. Because, uh -huh. you know, I did this a half century ago, a quarter century. Well, the, it's also gone back to, it's also gone back to they're they're hiring professionals. That is, they're not. It's not. There's no youth element. The youth element is uh, does not exist. It has essentially gone back to its original roots of teams and experts. Only now they're in country teams and experts from those yeah, countries. Yeah, but there's a lot yeah. of transition for the organization. But they're not so many married people. It's mostly uh, single. Well, they might have a married couple somewhere. Mm -hmm. Well, it be interesting to talk to Don. But it's hard to relate to this, and yeah. I, I get the newsletter, and I admit I kind of read through it, and I think, you know, I'm really not interested in, in better pigs in Ecuador. I've done that. What fascinates me is there are two people, and they're looking for assistance, and mm -hmm. why, instead of running it on a shoestring, don't you just have them work with the government of Ecuador? You know, I mean, uh, but uh, but what is the alternative? 
The alternative is to go back to getting a lot of funding from the Rockefeller Brothers. We were getting funded from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Uh, they were approaching the Ford Foundation. Mm -hmm. They were approaching all the big foundations mm -hmm. in the late 50s to get funding for this. And then they met uh, AID, and it was kind of a, a very compatible relationship, and they kept going on that basis. Mm -hmm. It was a kind of a kind of the bottom tier in the, the hierarchical governmental structure. Yeah. But with the, the thing I'm interested in in terms of looking at the future is uh, that the Peace Corps, <laughs> the Peace Corps is clearly identified as U.S. government because it's run out of the State Department. Mm -hmm. So every Peace Corps person can legitimately be seen, uh, especially let's take a Muslim country. You know, the Peace Corps is the United States. There, there isn't any, uh, you know, these aren't poor Americans. These aren't the Americans without guns. These are people who run right out of the embassy. That is, that's where they, that's, that's where their contact point is. And, and, and that puts them, that puts them in a pretty clearly proactive mm -hmm. U.S. position. IVS. It's, it's independent, but it's if independent. you get all your money from the U.S. government, then what's it look like? And it looks like a covert operation run by the government. And if you get no money from the U.S. government, then you're broke. Then you're broke. And if you get it from a foreign country, the foreign country wants to know why they can't open, get Just their own Just do it people. themselves. So the alternative is to go to the foundations, and the foundations are bottoming out. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's only so many alternatives you can do. And, and that is an exceptionally fine way of bringing this interview to conclusion. Because well, I should say one does thing reach it. It frustrates me is that IBS, in a way, lost much of its institutional memory during the 1960s. Uh, I believe it was 1967, and I was beginning to work with AID. And I went in and I visited IBS. And I found that the, the uh, executive director was, uh, he was a nice guy, but, but he was trying to remain with the modern world. And what he had done is hired two young ladies who had no discernible experience in offices that I could discover. Mm -hmm. One of them had a, a three-year-old child and no husband and felt that much of her work would consist of taking care of her baby. So she'd bring the baby to the office and spend half her time on the floor playing with the child rather than doing things. They had rudiments of filing and clerical ability and uh, great difficulty with things like spelling words on the typewriter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they did their work. But one job they were given, uh, they were basically the hippie community that was trying to, where they were trying to uh, make a living, but IVS was trying to reach out a bit and help them at the mm -hmm. same time, which in a shame was, the way it was a shame because one of the jobs they had where they said, we have too many filing cabinets, we've got to clear these out. They would open the file folders mm -hmm. of an IVSer, and they'd read everything we had, all of the information, you know, application, letters of reference, everything that I set up when I went in found nothing going in 1960, or 59. Mm -hmm. And there was a certain pattern for putting this in. And they would look in, and they, the largest batch of things would be, let's say, uh, 12 to 15 two-page letters. So they'd take these out and throw them all away. And that's what happened to IVS's history. Mm -hmm. the, and, this was, and these reports that I wrote on Iraq and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Nepal, their early efforts, they're all gone. There, there's nothing there. I went through all the files they had last time I was in Washington. And, and their argument was, we well, just don't understand. This is all old history. It's not interesting anymore. Nobody's interested in it. And you don't understand how the world has changed. Pardon and that me? was that was their viewpoint. Oh. So we're going to throw out the past. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, this is 1967. This is 1967, mm -hmm. and that's what happened to a lot of it, along with the Red Guards. They were doing the same thing elsewhere. Um, and it's always been kind of disappointing to me that you start reading some of this stuff, and it's like they just invented the wheel. Um, but other organizations had the same thing. The Friends, American Friends Service Committee mm -hmm. had a really long letter about uh, eight years ago. And it was, they were telling what they had done in Laos. And this was just such a wonderful program. 
is they had gone into an area and they'd taken along a Volkswagen engine mounted in a frame mm -hmm. with a saw on it. And they were able to take logs and put them down and they would cut it and it, the People's Revolutionary Army was using this and it was just so wonderful what the Democratic Socialist Republic was doing. They had teams of young people going out and helping the farmers build schools and so on. And it was the first time it had ever been done. And I wrote a very polite letter back. I said, I read the article, but you must realize that those saws are the ones that we brought in in the 1960s, and the IVSers would get out in the villagers and work with the villagers and develop the schools and everything, and the AID government, or AID assisting the government, would bring in the, the technicians that would run the saws, and we would see the build, schools built and uh, stocked with teachers. Mm -hmm. And they would write back that I didn't understand the situation. But they wouldn't acknowledge that it had mm. been done by anybody before they got there, mm -hmm. which kind of irritates me as far as their friends are concerned. Well, were the friends of eight years ago actually... There were I mean, they had there no were... institutional memory of what had gone on in Laos? And the... Well, they were either ignoring it, or they were just reading this, hey, we got this great new program. We're going to bring saws in. And they were telling how it was done, but they claimed it had never been done before, that the American imperialists had just been over there and milked the government. I mean, you know, that's the way you read it. And and you'd point out, hey, look, we did this. Mm -hmm. And and we'd build the schools, and the Patet Lao would come in and bring them down. And, well, you just don't understand the situation. It's sort of like the Brafman thing. Yeah. You know, I've got my viewpoint. Don't disturb me with the facts. So... That was kind of an interesting situation. I did end up in a church once in uh, 1976 with a Hmong family just arrived in the United States. Mm -hmm. They'd been sponsored by a, uh, a friend's church somewhere in, uh, I don't know, Pennsylvania, maybe, Ohio. And I ran into the family by accident, and they were living in a 200-year-old farmhouse made of stone. Oh, this place was gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And they were so happy to find somebody who could speak Lao, and they wanted to talk to their sponsors. And it turned out that they'd done something wrong. First of all, why were we in such an old house? Mm -hmm. And I explained that they showed them great honor because Americans just loved old buildings, and this had the aura of the past and generations of ancestors and roots well, and so on. Understand? And that. they they ate that up. Yeah. <laughs> and then I got their sponsors in there, and the sponsors were happy to find somebody to talk to them. Right. And it turned out that they'd taken the baby to church, and we've got this new carpet, and will you please ask them if they could maybe use diapers? And the young mother said, sure, what are diapers? And I translated, what are diapers? And everybody goes, I said, let me explain. You know, grass roof buildings, dirt floors, kids running around with no pants on until the age of four. Oh, okay, next thing I've got all these church women on the floor here, with dish towels trying to argue over which way you fold a diaper and the family is eating this up and I'm explaining, you know, you don't throw them away, you wash them over and you know, it was a great evening. I took them to the church the next morning. I stayed overnight and went to church the next morning and by chance we had a, a friend's uh, man who had been there in Vietnam and he was just so happy the war was over there was all peace and i was just sitting back there giving a verbatim what he was and that you know, started with well, doesn't he understand they're communists they're killing us you know and and uh, so i introduced the two after church and and uh, he was just sort of disaffected like oh yes yeah, sorry about that but you don't understand the situation no you don't understand the yeah. situation but, uh, uh, of course, that's the biggest misunderstanding of the situation that practically there was, yeah. since the, uh, there was a comment made, I, it may have been by, by, by uh, Fred Bramford, it may have been someone else, and it was, I don't think it was Fred, I think it may have been Garrett, where he said, how do you, how do you make reparations or address commitments when there isn't supposed to be a war in mm -hmm. the first place? Yeah. And that the problem of having a secret war, no, th I think this actually came out of the article in the New York Times on the commandos. Mm. Uh, if something doesn't exist, 
how do you how do you make it right? Now, how do you acknowledge commitments to something that's not supposed to happen? Yeah. And no, no, it, it wasn't in the article on the commandos, but it was about the Hmong in general, and that uh, uh, it's something because of Jane. I, I know Jane quite well, by the way. I mean, she's not a friend I'm of mine. Yeah, and yeah, I know her quite well. well you saw my as an activist, the whole thing. absolutely. <laughs> and uh, but the thing is that it's it's as it's as if. Uh, that, that for too long and, and for a crucial period of time, uh, there wasn't any way in which the American people could constructively address what had gone on in Southeast Asia because they thought they knew what was happening. Yeah. Then they realized they had no idea. Then the war was over, and for many people, it was even for extreme leftists, for example, mm. it was, let's just turn away from it. That chapter yeah. is closed. And, we don't uh, want to admit we're wrong. Do well, we? it's not so much wrong. Well, that that's another it's all issue. It's been set right. Now. But it's it's over. No, it's yeah. over, and it has nothing to do with us anymore. And the problem is that the Khmer Rouge, in fact, were something that mm -hmm. were a result of it, at least connected with the war, and that we shouldn't be turning away from it in the end under the Reagan and Bush administration. What we ended up doing was supporting Pol Pot. Mm -hmm. That is officially because uh, you know it, uh, because of our uh, hostility with Vietnam. No, uh, you know Lon it's, it's amazing. His daughter lives in the second house over. No, I'm in serious. Laverne. She rents from me. And it took mm -hmm. me five years to figure out the exact relationship. Mm -hmm. Her name is Lon San Nam. Mm -hmm. And her husband's name is Don San. They're now known as Sam, Sam Don mm -hmm. and San Nam mm -hmm. Don. But her name is really Lon San Nam. And her stepdaughter, it's actually her niece, mm -hmm. was brought out with the family. They got out and they got the phone call. They jumped in the uh, Mercedes. Mm -hmm. She spent an hour convincing her husband. They grabbed what they could, jumped in the Mercedes with two or three nephews and nieces, mm -hmm. headed for the border, got through, and the border closed about a half hour later. And they ended up in a refugee camp in Thailand, came to the United States, sponsored by the church here, who did not understand I got all of these wonderful Lao-speaking families for you. I was in Fort Chaffee, Arkansas at the time. Mm -hmm. So I come back uh, in January of 76, and the church is having some problems, and they want me to translate. And I'll say, as I've explained numerous times, I don't speak Khmer. I speak Lao. And they said, oh, aren't they all the same? No, again, they're not the same language. <laughs> but I ended up doing the explanation because I can speak broken English better than anybody else. <laughs> Five years later, a couple of teachers come to me and they said, uh, we're having a little problem with this girl. She's an obvious liar. I said, what's she lying about? Well, she wrote this report claiming that her grandfather is the president of Cambodia or premier of Cambodia. He said, well, it could be true. could be true. He said, look, they weren't big countries. And a lot of people were related. Let me, let me check it out. And I figured out, well, this is Lan Mo. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense, you know. So I'm introducing Sam Nong to one person one day. And they said, Sam Nong is quite, uh, you know, very important in her own country. Her uncle is Lan Mo. Isn't that right? And they looked at her. And she said, uh, looked at me, and she said, "Yes, my uncle was Lan Mo." And then they left, and she came over. She says, "What are you telling me that for?" And I said, "Why not?" And she said, "Well, you know, he's my father." And I said, "Yes, I know he's your father. You never tell me, but I figure it out." <laughs> well, why are you telling him? She says, "I don't want. Don't tell anybody." I said, "Why?" She says, "Because the Khmer Rouge." killed everybody in the family that was there. And if they find they're here, that we're here mm -hmm. in Laverne, California, they will come and they will kill us. Mm -hmm. And she was quite, mm -hmm. quite uh, <laughs> aware of this and, and wanted to keep it. Anyway, he died a couple years later and there was some super hoopla of a funeral down here in Brea. Mm -hmm. And the uh, two spinster sisters that had been helping the family and myself were invited down, and, and it was, you know, we had three television channels covering the thing. And it was a uh, Buddhist funeral. Uh, they buried him rather than cremation for some reason. Hmm. And, uh, oh, it was it was camp. It was 
It was the monks, it was the girls with the flowers, it was the califac and the family in white tearing their hair and pulling the whole thing. And a lot of people with these glasses standing there kind of looking at everybody in the crowd and looking at each other. And, and the, the widow trying to throw herself in the grave as the daughters pulled her back. And it was, it was quite dramatic. I, did, I took no camera that day because I wanted to get into it, but it was, it was really, really camp. Well, uh, Vung Pao spoke at this uh, conference on the Vietnam War at, uh, there's a, this thing called the Center. This is where hopefully a copy of all these uh, mm -hmm. recordings will eventually end up just for safekeeping because they've got so much money for this archive. $20 million to start with. And uh, I think Vung Pao was a luncheon speaker. And, and this uh, hotel, the conference is in, since it's in Texas, especially this part of Texas, nothing's done outside. So the hotel literally is like a two story motel mm. with a roof built over it. So there's this huge enclosed space, maybe five, eight, four acres, about the size of a football field, let's put it that oh, way. Wow. And, and there are rooms on two, two levels around it, but all the activities, you know, the community activities, or the, the conference activities take place in this open area when they're not in conference rooms. And so he came to speak. And uh, of course, uh, they made a small mistake. You can't have someone setting up a dais and speak in a rectangular area with a person speaking here within 50 feet. You can't hear anything that he's saying. Mm -hmm. And it was also done by with translation. That is, he, he spoke in Lao, and then it was translated. And, mm -hmm. you know, we were, I was, I was just out of the table that was furthest from that thing. They couldn't hear a single word that anybody was saying. But what was impressive, first of all, was him, because he's grown, you know, this incredible beard. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, it's amazing. And, That's uh, interesting. I and and, that, and then I think so. And uh, there were so many other people there. But No, well, what is that? What am I thinking? Oh, I was thinking of General Khan. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. That'll yeah, be General Khan, nice. is, he is, he is, he's grown a beard as... Uh, it's an interesting story, but he had a, a personal commitment to someone who died. Uh, and and this is his way of kind of making, continuing that commitment, we think, by growing the spirit. But Vung Pao was there and he gave his speech. And literally on the second floor along the whole balcony were the kinds of guys that you would recognize. Suits, wraparound glasses like this, yeah. you know, armed to the teeth all over the place. And the sad thing about the conference was that Pete Peterson was there, mm -hmm. who Clinton has nominated as mm -hmm. the next, uh, the first, the first new, well, the first ambassador. To the uh, to the government to the country, and uh, uh, he had to have the same U.S. military had the same paramilitary presence to protect him. Mm. But it was of course provided by by the city of Lubbock. But it was like uh, it was interesting. This guy is a leader of an army in a war against a foreign country, which continues to go on. And in that sense, you could argue. He either feels threatened that his life's in danger, or the fact that his life's in danger can be used politically mm. uh, to gain support and sympathy for his cause. But Pete Peterson's just a congressman. Wow. <laughs> and he requires a bodyguard because of, one would assume, the POW MIA activists. That's pretty scary. You know, that's uh, well, someday that's I'm going to go down to Redondo Beach or some, you know, somewhere in there. Yeah. But uh, Nguyen Cao Ki runs a liquor store. He runs a liquor store here now? In Los Angeles. Oh. Yeah. Somebody sought him out huh. and had an interview with him. Is this recently? I mean, the last uh, five years? Five or six years okay. ago. I can okay. remember reading the story. Uh -huh. And uh, nobody in the neighborhood knew who he was. And the reporter got, I could have read it there or elsewhere, but apparently uh -huh. the way he became the uh, premier of Vietnam was there was this huge room full of three or hundred officers or so on, and, and uh, uh, Nguyen's NDM was gone, and a couple of successors were gone, and the question was, who's going to be the next premier of South Vietnam? And, well, who wants to do it? And they looked around, and Nguyen Cao Ki looked around and figured, oh, I know as much or more than any of the rest of these guys. I'll do it. And everybody looked at me and thought, why the hell not? He's the Air Force, and he's young, young. Next thing you know, they may be president. Yeah, he and, likes to and, yeah, he likes to tell that story. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, then he anyway comes to the states and uh, oh, what was it? There was one. There's this one great story about how he got to the airport. I forget who, Frank Schrapp or somebody, one of the top CIA operatives, is driving through a town in a jeep 
with the ex-premier and a couple of uh, suitcases full of cash in the back seat and arms all over under the seats and he's driving to the airport and thinks, what the hell am I doing here? This is, this is a novel, you know, and he gets him out the airport and gets him on a plane. Anyway, he comes Frank to, Snip, right. Frank Snip, uh -huh. right. Okay. It's one of the yeah. books about the CIA. Right. Uh -huh. Anyway, he ends up there, and, and they go to the street in which he lives, and it's just kind of a nice little cul-de-sac with, with uh, little houses, ranch houses, and flowers around the front. And they interviewed a couple neighbors. One of them says, oh, so that's who he is. I didn't know anything about it. They're very quiet. I'll tell you one thing. His wife is the best-looking chick in the whole block. Which I thought was kind of a nice way to put it. Well, what's interesting is the president, too, has managed to retain, you know, he lives in England, mm -hmm. uh, retain his privacy and, and never speak. I mean, he's kind of like the Robert McNamara. You know, yeah. He never spoke after the war. But uh, I did have a, you'll, 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 I think you'll find this entertaining. Now, well, question was, on, that, the, yeah. on that. On that meeting you had 1969? Yeah, uh-huh. Do you have any of the papers that came out of it? No. Uh -huh. Check with June. She may have Okay. Them. And if list. she doesn't have any, I'll go out here. I've got a trunk, a black trunk, about the size of this table, okay. and it's full. It's got, for two years before I went to Laos, and, and during the time I was there, and ever since, I just put stuff into that trunk. Right. And I've Ooh, got books, articles, reports, calendars, uh, currency. It, it's all the miscellaneous paper. Uh, information. I've got the Vientiane News. Well, of course, you you have you, you realize. Uh, I don't I don't want to get yeah. uh, modeling, but the point is that what you're sitting on is essentially an, an archive, yeah. the history of mm -hmm. Laos. Mm -hmm. I mean, forget U.S. presence, <laughs> but this stuff is stuff that in Laos that won't exist. Oh, won't be any of those well, no. What happened was no. Even that stuff. As, what happened as, was I'd take stuff like yeah, this uh -huh. and I'd put a, a file folder on mm -hmm. it and I'd put three staples in and cut it to the size of the page and I'd put a label on it. Mm -hmm. And I went over, somebody in USAID saw it and they got interested. So I sat down and made this long list of everything I had and I loaned it to them and they put it on the bookshelves and it was the USAID Technical Library because they didn't have anything on Laos, which was stupid because they'd, you know, they'd print a report and they'd throw it away. Well, I kept the reports and bound them and, mm -hmm. and you ended up with a lot of really interesting stuff this mm -hmm. way. So anyway, they had it. And... Uh, for years, people used it, and then finally I was checked out of the country, and I went over and said, hi, I'm here, I've got to get at this, and library said, who are you? And I said, here's the list, these are all mine, and I took my five-foot bookshelf and put it back in and came home, mm -hmm. and they they were despondent, they, that, they just lost it, but, you know, two years later, they were gone, <laughs> and uh, that's the reason I have it. Well, that's, uh, but it's, it's if just you run into, who is it, who's in New York now? Oh, the guy who's the head of IBS and, uh, or I mean, the head of uh, Bill Sage. Okay. And Bill Sage, I knew him and trusted him, and I just took him the whole trunk one day and, and uh, or gave it to somebody going to San Francisco and owed me an album, and he dropped it off for him. And he, I believe, photostatted or Xeroxed it, and he made his bibliography of books, articles, and reports. Mm -hmm. And so he's mentioned a lot of this stuff in it. And the interesting stuff he made copies of. Mm -hmm. He's a very, very thorough uh, librarian, historian. Well, it's a, it's a, it's an amazing thing. I mean, uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, let's let's put it this way: even today, the the study of these kinds of things is all colored by our experiences of the past. Mm -hmm. Hundred years from now, they won't be. Hundred years from now, people might actually want to know, mm. and they'll be asking different questions because. The interesting thing about the past is that uh, every generation asks completely different questions of one, you know, oh, yeah. of the of the other one, and and the the more data we have, especially now, when, of course, th there's a what do you call it? seduction of the electronics mm. because because uh, uh, electronics no longer can be read after three years. In other words, things written in programs and put saved oh, no, in certain it's... ways they can't be read anymore. On a CD, they're non readable. No, the CD is still holding out. But 20 years from now, there isn't going to be any CD. And this is the problem, that, that you the hard the, copy... They yeah. deteriorate or... No, the machines change until nobody has the machines that read 
those, like for example, a machine oh, okay. that reads a CD-ROM, oh, okay. 10 years from now won't exist. Oh, sure. I, I mean, it'll it. exist in an antique store, but not for a scholar. Anyway, the... He was the one to whom Jesus gave his mother, saying, Woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. He was the one who ran to the tomb and saw that Jesus had truly been raised. And he was the one who had the see after the resurrection was convinced that Jesus Christ was the one who came to them beside the sea. Beloved indeed, he just needed love more than anyone else. But then as we see the years of this man's life stretch before us, as we realize that he became a faithful part of the early church there in Jerusalem, and as a result of that gave leadership of love and compassion and acceptance, we see an entirely different kind of man suddenly on the pages of, of Scripture. That instead of ambition, there's inclusive love. Instead of negativism, there's affirmation. We see him go down to the Samaritan village to affirm those who have received the Holy Spirit and lay hands on them gently that they might have power from God. John was a new man. The risen Christ had performed the miracle that life with Jesus could not have performed. And the result was that that which he saw he must do when he lived and walked with Jesus of Nazareth, now he was given power to do and to become. Later he went to Rome. There he was a part of the church, judged, negated by the Roman Empire. And then the Ephesus. And it was in Ephesus that he gained a deep love for the churches, not only in Ephesus, but in the villages around the Roman province of Asia. And it was to those particular churches that he did his ministry. And at the end of his life, there's a wonderful story that depicts how the son of thunder became the most loving man who ever lived among the apostles. Listen to this. They carried him on their shoulders to the place where the church met together. And then the church would gather around this great old man, now in his 90s. And he'd simply say, little children, love one another. At one time, an upstart young deacon said, why didn't you always say that? Doesn't he have any other message? And Jerome records his answer. And the answer was, it is the Lord's word. And if you do that, everything else will fit into its place. You see the transformation over the lifetime? A 20-year-old rebel, an ambitious, an acquisitive person. Now, as the result of the work of the power of the Holy Spirit in his life, the living Christ, the basic ingredient of his leadership is love. The basic message that he had to preach was love. The knowledge of God was forgiveness. The new beginning and power. Let us love one another as Christ has loved us. It was at the end of his life, somewhere between 90 and 100, at the end of the first century, that John's concern for the church at Ephesus prompted the writing of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And what we get in this first chapter is the seasoned, settled result of a life in Christ. I've grown to love senior saints, people in whom the fullness of Christ has been tested through the years. Oh, I love the enthusiasm and excitement of youth, and I love the strategy and direction of middle age. But there is something about someone who's lived in faithful obedience to Christ through the years, and out of the richness of it, gives his direction. Hold that image in your mind of John being carried into the fellowship and speaking these words, then writing these words so that they might never forget. I believe that the need in the church at Ephesus is the greatest need in the church in America. Later, from the Revelation, we understand that the greatest need in the church of Ephesus was the fact that beliefs had grown dull and the power and the passion of their first love had grown cold. You remember when the living Christ walked among the candlesticks of the church, when he came to the church of Ephesus, he said, I have this against you. 
you have lost your first love. How easy it is, after you first fall in love with Christ, as the demands of the pressures of life take a hold of us, and as the years go by, for those very things which were most exciting to us become bland and everyday and commonplace and no longer the basis of our life. The reason that John wrote to the church at Ephesus and into all of those churches there in the area of Asia was simply to help them recover the excitement of being in Christ so that they could face the difficulties of the life that they were living. They were being pressured on every side to worship uh, the Roman gods, Roma, Caesar worship. Gnosticism was penetrating and chewing away at the fiber of their philosophy. There was conflict everywhere. The sensuousness was unloose, and a kind of antinomian freedom, a lawlessness, was recommended to them. And to that crew of people, John wrote these three things. Wake up to reality, be realistic, dare to be a real person. You see, what he was trying to do was to help them understand what God had done and what that could mean. But more than that, he wanted them to discover the secret of what had transformed his own life. If indeed we see the young rebel made into the most loving of mature men, it was because he had discovered the secret of the honest, open life. He was honest before God and utterly open to receive. Everything about society, the institutions of which we are a part, the culturation of the family and the institutions that shape us and mold us, form us into people who are dishonest and closed. Our dishonesty is that we learn to pretend. Our closedness is that we no longer are receptive people. We don't know how to allow people to minister to us and care for us and reach in and heal the hurting places in us. The same lie that's been sold to American culture was sold to the Ephesians. And that's why the first letter of 1 John is absolutely necessary. What he wanted them to know was that reality had come. In Jesus Christ, what was truly real had come incarnate into the world. What he wanted them to know was that the world in which they found themselves, Ephesus, the area of the province of Asia, was not real. That was not reality. Christ was reality, and on the basis of his reality, they could see what was happening in the world around them. You see, that's what begins the Christian life, when you realize that God, who was in the beginning, came into history to reveal his nature, but also to show us the nature of what life was to be. That's what grips John in the prologue here, in the first paragraph. He came amongst us as life, eternal life. And that means not quantity of life, it's quality of life. It's not, in, not adding years to your life, it's adding life to your years. No, there's a difference. What he's saying is that once you come to meet Jesus Christ, the living God in our midst, then you begin a life which death cannot end. It means that your mind, your emotions, and your will are fused together into a unity under the guidance and direction of the living Christ. His life is reproduced in us so that then we know the reality of eternal life, and that gives us fellowship with God and fellowship with each other. Wake up to that reality. That's truth. Everything else is confusion. The reason for which we were born was to know God intimately and to know each other intimately as we care for each other and stand with each other. Now John goes on to say, live realistically. That is, see yourself as you are, see other people as they are, and see God as he is. This is the message which we have received and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And when you come into fellowship with him, you see yourself as you are, really are, and that is both exciting and painful and unsettling. Walking in the light is the secret of experiencing the power of the resurrection. It means opening ourselves to the penetrating investigation and inventory of God. It means that the pure white light of God exposes everything that we've been and everything that we've done, the way we relate to people, the values by which we live, 
Everything is up for examination and up for review when you come into the presence of the living Christ. And the reason that many people say they don't experience the resurrection is because they are afraid of what the resurrected Christ is going to do when he pours his white light into the heart. It's no wonder we keep our religion nebulous. It's no wonder we get philosophical. And when things get too close, we reorganize. You know, we're going to reorganize our denomination again. That means the Holy Spirit's getting close again. And usually that's exactly what we do. Anything to evade standing abject and naked before the living God saying, God, show me what I'm really like. that the need in the church at Ephesus is the greatest need in the church in America. Later, from the Revelation, we understand that the greatest need in the church at Ephesus was the fact that beliefs had grown dull and the power and the passion of their first love had grown cold. You remember when the living Christ walked among the candlesticks of the church, when he came to the church of Ephesus, he said, I have this against you. You have lost your first love. How easy it is, after you first fall in love with Christ, as the demands of the pressures of life take a hold of us, and as the years go by, for those very things which were most exciting to us become bland and everyday and commonplace and no longer the basis of our life. The reason that John wrote to the church at Ephesus and into all of those churches there in the area of Asia was simply to help them recover the excitement of being in Christ so that they could face the difficulties of the life that they were living. They were being pressured on every side to worship uh, the Roman gods, Roma, Caesar worship. Gnosticism was penetrating and chewing away at the fiber of their philosophy. There was conflict everywhere. The sensuousness was unloose. And the kind of antinomian freedom of lawlessness was recommended to them. And to that crew of people, John wrote these three things. Wake up to reality, be realistic, dare to be a real person. You see, what he was trying to do was to help them understand what God had done and what that could mean. But more than that, he wanted them to discover the secret of what had transformed his own life. If indeed we see the young rebel made into the most loving of mature men, it was because he had discovered the secret of the honest, open life. He was honest before God and utterly open to receive. Everything about society, the institutions of which we are a part, the culturation of the family and the institutions that shape us and mold us, form us into people who are dishonest and closed. Our dishonesty is that we learn to pretend. Our closeness is that we no longer are receptive people. We don't know how to allow people to minister to us and care for us and reach in and heal the hurting places in us. The same lie that's been sold to American culture was sold to the Ephesians. And that's why the first letter of 1 John is absolutely necessary. What he wanted them to know was that reality had come. In Jesus Christ, what was truly real had come incarnate into the world. What he wanted them to know was that the world in which they found themselves, Ephesus, the area of the province of Asia, was not real. That was not reality. Christ was reality, and on the basis of his reality, they could see what was happening in the world around them. 
See, that's what begins the Christian life, when you realize that God, who was in the beginning, came into history to reveal his nature, but also to show us the nature of what life was to be. That's what grips John in the prologue here, in the first paragraph. He came amongst us as life, eternal life. And that means not quantity of life, it's quality of life. It's not, in, not adding years to your life, it's adding life to your years. No, there's a difference. What he's saying is that once you come to meet Jesus Christ, the living God in our midst, then you begin a life which death cannot end. It means that your mind, your emotions, and your will are fused together into a unity under the guidance and direction of the living Christ. His life is reproduced in us. So that then we know the reality of eternal life, and that gives us fellowship with God and fellowship with each other. Wake up to that reality. That's truth. Everything else is confusion. The reason for which we were born was to know God intimately and to know each other intimately as we care for each other and stand with each other. Now John goes on to say, live realistically. That is, see yourself as you are, see other people as they are, and see God as he is. This is the message which we have received and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And when you come into fellowship with him, you see yourself as you are, really are, and that is both exciting and painful and unsettling. Walking in the light is the secret of experiencing the power of the resurrection. It means opening ourselves to the penetrating investigation and inventory of God. It means that the pure white light of God exposes everything that we've been and everything that we've done, the way we relate to people, the values by which we live. Everything is up for examination and up for review when you come into the presence of the living Christ. And the reason that many people say they don't experience the resurrection is because they are afraid of what the resurrected Christ is going to do when he pours his white light into the heart. It's no wonder we keep our religion nebulous. It's no wonder we get philosophical. And when things get too close, we reorganize. You know, we're going to reorganize our denomination again. That means the Holy Spirit's getting close again. And usually that's exactly what we do. Anything to evade standing abject and naked before the living God saying, God, show me what I'm really like. Are 30 minutes aside. Yours is oh, probably okay. 45. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so they came up with a, a very nice locally made coffin. It was the old French style. It was sort of, uh, you know, it was wide in the shoulders and mm -hmm. tapered and mm -hmm. had a cross on the top. And it was lined with uh, zinc or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, his body was placed in that and taken to the airport and flew to the United States. And Later on, uh, Chester Brown was, there was some sort of a ceremony where they were awarding medals, and uh, I had to go down and had a black velvet cushion made. I just explained that, hey, I want this material to make a cushion about this big and about this thick. It's for the awarding of the design, and the local tailor whipped it up, and I gave it to Chet, and he went out and held this, and His Majesty the King came along, and uh, an aide placed on the black cushion a uh, uh, the award of the million elephants mm -hmm. and this was for the IBS or who had, who had drowned and I had to take all of his things and and package them up and, and send them back which was kind of interesting because his diary was in it and I read it and I was in the diary mm -hmm. you know and he was he was a very Christian very conscientious sort that that always said the rosary in the morning and the evening and and he he did make some interesting comments about the the world as he expected it mm -hmm. to be and that that he was amazed at the way people accepted what could be 
done and what couldn't be done and went along with cases, even Galen, which, and then he gave an instance or two, which I don't remember. And uh, I always thought that, and I always kind of wished that I'd made a little copy of it, but I felt a little guilty for reading it anyway. Mm -hmm. But uh, he would start out with the prayers for so-and-so, just write him in his little diary. So anyway, I sent all that back. Uh, that wasn't death. Now, later on, the death started to, or the incidents started mm -hmm. to increase. We had one particularly jovial guy. He was Jewish. He was in New York. He you, had you wouldn't hair. believe that. It says Jewish. Uh, Jews in Laos was one of the questions okay. I was going to ask you. Like, yeah. Chaim Levitt. Uh -huh. C-H-A-I-M-L-E-A-V-I-T-T. Uh -huh. okay. And Chaim Levitt had this huge nose and curly hair. He was the stereotype, and he was a terrific guy. Mm -hmm. I've got a picture of him out here somewhere mm -hmm. holding a rifle. And he and some of the guys had gone hunting. Or maybe somebody had gone hunting. <clears throat> but they shot a wild pig. And here he was. Kind of <laughs> well, there's, the there, goes, pig there goes his Jewish With a statue. big smile on his face. <laughs> yes. And Kaim Levitt and another guy ended up in, uh, well, they were a pair. They, they just you know, were roommates the entire time they were in Laos. And they were in a house somewhere when bullets started going through one side of the building and out the other. Uh, we left that particular site the same night and never went back to it. I don't even remember where it was. It was in central Laos somewhere. Uh, could have been the side of Boy Province or north of Yintown somewhere, but Anyway, they moved to another site. I, 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 think, I think the first site they were at, there was something happened and they had to leave because of patrols in the area and there was a firefight down the street or something. Mm -hmm. And the second time they were somewhere and uh, it could have been Takek in that area. I again have to read. But I think that there had been some shooting and they came around the corner and found bodies here and there on the road, which was kind of hard to take. And so there was a lot of evaluation as to whether they wanted to stay there and this would change. And they moved to a third site, and this is the place where the bullets started going mm -hmm. through the wall. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was quite an epic, uh, you know, I mean, they did a lot of reevaluation <laughs> of life and their role in it and everything. Mm -hmm. But uh, Kime didn't worry about it because he had about... Uh, Oh, I guess two or three months left. And he did, you know, worked here or there, just little miscellaneous, fi finishing up for other people's projects. Mm -hmm. And uh, then left the country. He did not go back to the United States. He flew via South Asia to Israel. Mm -hmm. And one of the guys got a letter from him a couple months later. <laughs> uh, apparently, he arrived about one week before the Six-Day War broke out, and he ended up as a uh, riding in a Jeep with a machine gun. <laughs> you know, he had some rather tongue-in-cheek, pungent remarks about the entire situation. Where, and we, we, you know, we used to joke. Jo uh, just about the kind of level, wherever he went, where he went, the war started, and finally he went where it was safe in Tel Aviv, and there, the Six Day War erupted. It's one of these jinxes sort of things. Mm -hmm. um, you ask about Jews in, in uh, yeah. Laos. Mm -hmm. There was uh, one chap who was a um, area coordinator. He worked with AID, Agency for International Development. Actually, it was. Uh, Oh, I guess Howie and Klein and uh, this chap, his name was Diffendorfer. Mm -hmm. And he and his wife were very nice people. And he was just so much out of his element as the area coordinator in Paxe in southern Laos. And uh, they had a, a child. I don't remember if it was a boy or a girl. I don't remember. It was probably a boy. And he was probably uh, seven or eight. And... Uh, the local Protestant missionaries were having a big Christmas celebration, and uh, Devin Durfer was saying, eh, it was hard for his wife. She had to sit down and <laughs> explain to their son why he couldn't go to this Christmas celebration, because all the other kids were going, and he was supposed to be a shepherd in the chorus and so on. And Devin Durfer was, uh, 
that's the only aspect of that I know about. Mm -hmm. Personally, he was one of the most out of place people in the in the country that I knew of. He uh, he had no idea of what we were doing, and yet he was my boss. Mm -hmm. And the Lao officials I was dealing with knew this, mm -hmm. and they also knew that he was a jerk. And he used to go around with, with wearing uh, Bermuda shorts, no, cut off. Well, they weren't cut offs, they were short shorts, you know. Mm -hmm. And he had this big rose garden that he took care of. And I had to approach him very carefully and explain what he should do in a nice way so that he would do it, you know. Uh, we ended up in a situation once where a Lao general showed up at his house because he was so concerned about the status of something going on and he could speak fairly good broken English and Diffenderfer listened to everything he had to say and then took him on a tour of the Rose Garden and it drove this general up the wall that the American he was trying to explain is you know sit down on a man-to-man -man basis and get things solved and I uh, heard about this and I said he did what oh he came to my house he was so nice and he well he talked uh, we, it was hard he was telling about this but I, anyway I gave him a very good tour of the Rose Garden and I said you know I really I really think you ought to sit down and talk with the people in Vientiane and, and let's get some work done and go and personally look him up and say uh, you know you were disconcerted to hear this could only show him the Rose Garden but let's work out some solutions to this because he's He's probably gone off the deep end right now because he, for him to come to you was a great honor and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, he also, and this was a relation that the aid officials sometimes they didn't know what they're doing. You, you showed him that they did like this, mm -hmm. you know, when you greet each other. So Diffenderfer would go into a room, hey, hello everybody, how are you doing? You know, and everybody would look at him like he was crazy. So having seen this once or twice, I. I said, boy, you can tell that little old man from the village. And he said, what? And I said, well, that little old man, he really doesn't know the, he's, he's Lao, but he doesn't know his own uh, traditions. And everybody thinks he's a little bit crazy because he comes in and he goes like this and this, when he should just go like this. Oh, so that, that was the way of you're showing him the right way of and, and, what, what in India would be called making namaste. Yeah. yeah. Putting your hands together. And, and, and this is what's called a Y in Lao. Mm -hmm. And this is what uh, Diffenderfer did the right way after that. Mm -hmm. But I could never quite bring myself. No, I think you found uh, the absolute appropriate You had, to, you had to work with a lot of people rather obliquely. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the epic time came when one of the governors was with Diffenderfer. And I was there. Uh, he called me in as an interpreter because I spoke Lao. And the governor would ask a question Lao, and I'd tell Diffenderfer, and he'd search for an answer and give me an answer in English, and, and I'd tell the governor, and the governor know a bit of, of English. And I would pass on a straight question and get a straight answer or get something that didn't make sense at times. And finally the governor looked at me and said, I don't know what the hell he's talking about. Or no. No, it started out the governor, the, the conversation was going along, and then Diffenderfer said, oh, Galen, I, I guess I'll have to attend. Monsieur le governor, uh, avec le problème, and he started going on on this French he was trying to learn, and it was, it was like he was reading it from a textbook when all the accents were wrong. And I never studied French. I just, you know, learn a word here and there, or meet a French girl and talk, and you know. And so he explained this all in French. And the governor turned to me, he looked very thoughtful. He looked at me and he said in Lao, I don't know what the hell he's talking about, do you? And I said very politely in Lao, I believe he was trying to speak French to you. I myself do not speak French, but what he was trying to say was, and I explained, my translation of his French to the governor. And and you just sort of dealt with it. That particular conversation though went, went on so fast that at one time the Lao was speaking the the Lao was speaking English 
Diffendorfer was speaking Lao and I was speaking French. I mean, we, you know, I, going along in a conversation, and I suddenly realized that was what the last 30 seconds had been, is each one of us was using a, a language that was alien to what we normally spoke, and then suddenly we were back into the regular English Lao uh, bit. Uh, what were the, what was the, uh, I mean, I, I, ha I have, happen, don't believe that the, I, I, this is not the right way of approaching it, but the idea, the role of women in IBS in, in, in Laos. Do you have any stories or... or uh, well, turn off everything. I've got to go ahead. Yeah, yeah. That's a, this is a good time. In fact, I was going to suggest that. Mm -hmm. And let's get that started. Uh, anyway, about the women in IBS. Were there many women in the early years? Yes. The... Um, one of them just died here at Hillcrest recently. No, who was that? Um, let me think for a while. Okay, she got she got married since she was an IBS. Now okay. I think of her IBS name, and I have to remember the last name, and I can't remember the IBS name now. Mm -hmm. uh, back in nineteen, the the original concept was that IBS would field teams of young Americans with college degrees or, and or uh, demonstrated expertise in their fields. Mm -hmm. Uh, you might have a young college graduate from Kansas with a degree in livestock or poultry husbandry, or, or at the same time you might have somebody who didn't have a college degree but who'd run a, uh, a tractor and uh, what would you call it, a, a small engine repair shop for three years. But he only had two years of college. I mean, somebody like that would be great if you ended up in a, in a thing where you were having a uh, machinery repair type uh, class at a the National Education Center in Laos, for example. Demonstrated expertise and or a degree or both. And the original concept was that on these teams, and this was shown in India because they had some uh, public health nurses who did a fantastic job of training local indigenous nurses and the concept, uh, and also in, in Iraq you had nurses and it carried over into Laos where nurses and home economists were um, an integral part of the entire program. Uh, we had one girl who was, I believe she was Canadian even, uh, Brenda Gorman, who in 1965 and 66 uh, was in Laos and was uh, teaching the home economists. Um, and we there was another gal who was out in the field who had the local public health nurses at the Pakak Hospital, and she was more or less the chief nurse and trained the nurses. And usually you ended up with the women in group situations, uh, training them how to cook better food, how to use uh, bulgur wheat, how to improve the taste of the local varieties of rice, how to, how to bake, you know, little things like this. You, but the the public health nurses were much more in a situation where they were in hospital roles, working with local technicians, but getting a lot of use aid commodities, mm -hmm. uh, medical types. I know that Brenda did, uh, well, when we had the Great Flood in 1966 in Vientiane, she went around and helped set up, what would you call them, first aid centers, and the great fear was for cholera, and they got some vaccine somewhere and started inoculating everybody, and she was showing IBSers how to do it. And my friend Jack up in Canada, I got a picture of him and her. I was riding around the motor scooter taking pictures of everybody else doing everything. Mm -hmm. And so she was training the IBSers how to give the shots to protect people from cholera and what have you out there. Mm -hmm. uh, they were pretty well accepted. I usually uh, administering the housing of the IBS teams in Vientiane, which was temporary, you know, and they, they got their housing and did their clothing and everything out in the field. But in Vientiane, I had the housing and uh, hired a lady to do the washing, and, and they paid this lady on a piecework basis until it got to be a mess. And then I charged everybody a dollar a night and then they got free laundry done. Mm -hmm. Although I did have some discussion with people that brought in three weeks of dirty laundry from the field and expected it to do it all at once. So in each one of these situations, Go on to the plus side. 
in each one of these housing situations, there was a usually, I guess, it was just kind of automatic that there was kind of a, uh, a girl who was in charge of everything. How does this thing work? Let me just stick your thumb in. Oh, you turn it over. <laughs> Side two? Yours is still good. Mine got no, two. No, mine's fine. Yours has got two lights and mine's got yeah. one. There you go. Mine's got <laughs> we don't two want to put them too close, otherwise oh, okay. it picks up the tape. As, okay. Yeah. Um, in each one of these situations, there was usually one gal who was more mature than the rest who was based in Vientiane and became kind of the administrator with regard to women's situations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we discuss any problems that I was having <clears throat> with maybe, maybe a girl was uh, living, I, I had very few of these, but maybe you'd have a girl who came to uh, visit uh, Vien Chan and there was something happened and I was I was aware of something that was happening and I'd go to the gal and I'd say we got a problem here and she'd check it out and take care of the, the thing that, that you and I couldn't do because we'd plunge it physically. Mm -hmm. um, occasionally I uh, gave her a situation that was easier for her to work with. For example, the maid came to me and she said, that one girl in room such and such, the sheets were all bloody. Oh, fine. And I'd go, Brenda, solve this problem for us. You know, and, and things were taken care of. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were accepted uh, as, you know, just other IVSers. Mm -hmm. It's just that they had their own uh, world. Uh, some of them uh, dated anybody but IVSers. Mm -hmm. And you were never quite sure. You had uh, gals who would be dating pilots and uh, USAID personnel. But they just, you know, they weren't interested in IVSers. But, you know, that was all outside the work thing, and it didn't, didn't affect anything as far as I know. Uh, there, were, uh, there were women in cluster village teams yeah. also? Mm -hmm. yeah. I seem to remember a couple of them. Uh, there was, I believe, that there was at least one case where uh, somebody became pregnant, and it was handled very quietly and discreetly, and the child was, I believe she left IBS early and had the child and it was adopted by a local family. I know very little about it. A local I family think, in the States? Uh, I think it was an American family in Laos. In Laos. Mm -hmm. hmm. I know another gal who was really funny. She was Chinese American and uh, she had an interpreter and they were both jolly sorts. and. Uh, I don't know if she, I guess she was a home economist or a nurse working in the villages and she had an interpreter and one thing led to another and hey, let's get married and occasionally you did have marriages with local people. I've got some really gorgeous pictures that Jack took at a bossy of a, a one chap and, and the girl he married in the village mm -hmm. and uh, oh, IBS pretty well went along with it providing it didn't provide any real complications in carrying out the normal operation. I mean, what can you do? Mm -hmm. Anyway, she married this guy, and uh, I believe two months later, uh, his sister died, and his sister had a small baby. And the husband was in the military or something, and not knowing what to do, he adopted his sister's baby. And the reason I remember it is because she was telling me about it. She said, hey, he was in the bathroom, he was shaving one morning, he was laughing and laughing, and I walked in and said, what's going on? He was standing there looking in the mirror and he was saying, look, I was this carefree young bachelor until three months ago, and now I'm married, and I even have that baby. And uh, some of them, I guess, worked out, and some of them didn't, you know, on the, on the marriages. Mm -hmm. But they did have a definite role. And, worked in the situations as necessary. They did not go in it. I don't know of any on forward area teams. And they tended to be more in the capital and provincial centers. Mm -hmm. The National Education Center, I think half their team was uh, women teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, but home economists and nurses uh, are kind of hard to find. And they were working with 
counterparts in the Royal Lao government, mm -hmm. uh, the Ministry of uh, Education, Ministry of, uh, it wouldn't be home economics, but there was some sort of a ministry in there, and they, they trained nurses and, and uh, got cooking schools and things going, nutrition particularly. Mm -hmm. um, is, is it, um, did you ever meet David Dukes? Or, you know, the, yes, I, his, his, I met David You Dukes. must have met him. Yeah. Known him actually. This was really approximately well. 1960, must have been about 66. Mm -hmm. And David Duke was over there. He was, I think, 15 or 16 years old. I don't, I'm pretty sure he wasn't much older than that. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe 17. And he was quite intent, a very intelligent person, but he had really warped ideas. I met him, I believe, twice. And one time we sat, and I first it was just casual. He came up and referred to me as name, and I asked who he was, and he introduced himself, and we talked for a couple of minutes, and he trundled off. And uh, because by this time I was sort of a, a fixture in the landscape, and a lot of people knew me. They came and did it, went, and I was just sort of there. Mm -hmm. And he asked some questions about Lao. We got together the next time, and he began to explain to me that uh, his father worked for Aid or Air America or something, and he had, I gather, something of a uh, checkered pattern in his family relationships. I don't remember what it was. It was not typical. It, his father may have been a strong militarist or something of the sort. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember anything about his mother. And it could be that his father and mother were divorced and he was living with his father and going to the American school. And anyway, he started going on uh, telling about the class that he had out at the National Ed or at the uh, Army Center, and his job was to teach English to the Lao Army officers. And then he started telling me what he was teaching them, and it was words like nigger, and then he, and he started going on and on until it, you know he thought the Nazi Army was just absolutely great, and. Uh, got into race relations and uh, you know I listened somewhat stunned for about 20 or 30 minutes and and tried to figure out what in the world this guy was doing how could anybody hire him to be teaching Lao army officers and trying to figure out who I should talk to about this and I think I did call somebody in charge of the school and say I was definitely concerned about this one person and they thanked me politely uh, that they had other reports and something of this sort. Mm -hmm. And there was one 15-year-old girl. He may have been 17 or 18 by then. Mm -hmm. There was one 15-year-old girl who was, you look around and they, they take over a group. And this gal was not the most attractive and she wasn't the oldest, but there was something about her that the teenagers revered her. And a lot of them were just stupid, ungainly, junk food eaters that wanted nothing to do but eat, swim, and party. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have sat out by the USAID swimming pool and watched three or four kids get in this huge altercation and they say, oh, let's go to so-and-so, she'll know what to do. And they'd come over and they would talk to her and she would ask two or three polite questions and she would observe this and observe that and get everything settled and they would move off. And, She'd go back to reading her magazine or whatever. Just, mm -hmm. uh, just one of these natural leaders that everybody respected. And I went over to her, and I said, "I run into this chap by the name of David Duke." Can I explain my conversation and some of my concerns? And she'd say, "I gotta admit, those of us in high school, we don't know quite what to do with him either." And that's. The first and last time I ever ran into him. <laughs> uh, you know, we started t talking about uh, Art Stillman. Has there. anybody else mentioned him or what? Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, uh, Howard, uh, I think. Yeah. Uh, Howard Lewin, uh, I think, mentioned that, uh, that uh, but not that he'd met him directly, that he mm. more uh, heard of him or something like that. But uh, everyone, actually, people who know about his career know that he was in Laos and all of that. I don't think they know. Uh, you may just have placed on record the only actual first-person account mm. 
of meeting and talking with him and knowing what he was actually. I've met a lot of interesting was, people. You may have read it yeah. in the paper several years ago, but I, this is here, neither here nor there. But yeah. I went out on uh, what Seventh Street here, and there's this rather beautiful house that we have. And I drove up in my car one day, and the guy was had these uh, oh Bombador type glasses and kind of standing there with his arms folded and a couple of people picking up leaves on the lawn and and uh, I said hi you live here yes we live here now and I said well this is a very nice house it's a price house built in 1918 at the end of World War One and I went on to describe the house and so on and they've been rented you know we've rented he he did he was kind of non-committal the uh, you know, and I identified myself as being with the Historical Society and gave him a card. And I, I did notice the two people kind of look our direction and scuttle into the house. And so we, he didn't say too much. And anyway, after three or four minutes, I left. And that's how I met David Koresh. Really? Yeah, because they had the house here and they moved from here to uh, uh, Waco. And... Uh, after the Waco burning, I was sitting here at four o'clock, and then comes my local restaurant down here and my local waitress and the whole thing. Oh my goodness! That that is something. People thought they they they, they felt uh, uh, a special treat when they met John Steinbeck in Vietnam, something like that. Well, his son showed up in Laos. Uh, yeah. Uh huh. Well, yeah. he would. He was a newsman. I think. Uh. I don't, he wrote some stuff, uh -huh. but he was living on his father's reputation. Right. Mm -hmm. There was, uh, and this was one of the disillusionments mm -hmm. we had with some of the IVSers in, in that period, the 67, 68, 69, because uh -huh. the, the aid was pretty straight, and John Steinbeck shows up and is rented a house, and I went out one day, and, and there were half a dozen people wandering around zombies just coked up on marijuana or something else. And there were some of the IVSers were just quite excited about, you know, this is so-and-so. Was his name John also? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, that they had met John Steinbeck. Well, I didn't know which one he was. They all looked plastered to me. And, uh, you know, I left home. But the IVSers just thought this was really wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then also we had the... Uh, Sean Flynn. Uh -huh. I was back there. That was the next yeah. thing I was going to ask you. Yeah. Yeah. And after he disappeared into Cambodia and was never found, just a motorcycle and nothing else, mm -hmm. uh, and there was some IBS girl or maybe an international traveler, just tears in her eyes that he was just so wonderful and this, and it was such a great tragedy. And my, my attitude was, you know, the guy's an ass. He, everybody says, don't go, and he goes, and there's soldiers with guns, just like they told him, and he disappears. Mm -hmm. He got into it by himself. Mm -hmm. Maybe he didn't deserve it, but it was his fault. Oh, but he was just so handsome. And, and you begin to realize that either you were getting older or people were drifting into this uh, the 60s thing, which never really reached us too much. Mm -hmm. There I was, mean, did we, you, this did is a place where you could go down the market and buy marijuana by the kilo. Yeah. Uh -huh. I knew that things were getting bad when the little old man came up to me, and he had this little plastic package he'd made, and he had 20 hand-rolled mm -hmm. inside. Mm -hmm. Somebody ate Tom, Tanyaksu joint, blah, and he used the word joint. Mm -hmm. You know, and I knew, hey, everything's going to hell. <laughs> He, uh, was, was, but did Flynn spend much time in Laos? Or? Well, maybe six weeks. Mm -hmm. I, I, maybe that was Steinbeck. And, but I no, didn't see him or rap with him or anything. Mm -hmm. I may have seen Steinbeck, but there were about six people in that house. Yeah, that's funny. There's a, uh, there's a, actually, a, someone I know has written a book about his experiences in, in, in Cambodia. I knew him after he wrote, he wrote the stories. It's, it was called The Mark. I think it was Jacques Leslie. I Is remember. it been printed? Uh huh. Yeah. So it's, it came out last year. Yeah. And uh, but the the thing about the the, the Cambodian the, the problem was that since everyone was kind of like stuck in the capital, hmm. when you heard of an operation somewhere out. In the